Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Wajanki Museum to our second edition of Echoes of Antiquity Conference. Uh, I will now give the floor to Marianna Otmianowska, who is the acting director of the museum. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the great honor to welcome you here uh, in Royal Wajinki Museum, the summer residence of the last king of Poland, Stanislas August. As you can see, the touch of antique was important in everything for our last king of Poland and for his architectures, for his painters and sculptures. Uh, so we are um, uh, really very happy and I can say so proud that we can meet for the first day on conference here uh, in the palace in the heart of Royal Łazienki Museum. Um, there are so many distinguished guests and when I see on a program, um, I'm uh, impressed and awesome that there are so many interesting speeches uh, in um, uh, let me let me very warmly welcome the keynote speakers, Professor Gabriela Cianciolo, Professor Maria Fabricius Hansen, Dr. Juliette Harrison, and Astrid Nielsen. Thank you very much for coming there. Um, uh, the conference is for today, the first day is here in Royal Łazienki Museum, but maybe someone planned to stay longer in Warsaw. At Saturday there will be a beautiful day of opening um, uh, sculpture uh, by Roden in our garden, but you can see this sculpture actually from today, and I am sure that uh, Amelia, Amelia will show you where this uh, sculpture is, because the garden is very big, but uh, Amelia will show where uh, this is. There are so many activities um, uh, also during this conference, so I'm uh, very welcome and um, let's, uh, let's join to all those uh, um, uh, workshops and, and discussions and, and uh, occasions. Um, but I also want to say about something in your uh, uh, conference packages in boxes, actually in bags, <laughs> sorry. Um, there are um, uh, tickets uh, for free entrance to National Museum in Warsaw. Thank you very much uh, to Director Professor Gavel, the Director of National Museum in Warsaw, um, um, who p p p prepared um, uh, these tickets to the National Museum. Um, because uh, in National Museum there is a huge... Um, uh, p um, um, there is a, a, a huge collection of, uh, of antiques in a special gallery, but there are also another very interesting exhibitions. So uh, I really recommend uh, to join also this uh, museum. So one more time, thank you for coming there, for joining us here in Royal Łazienki Museum. Uh, I wish you absolutely beautiful time today and tomorrow at University of, of Warsaw. Um, and let's uh, talk during the, uh, during, during the breaks. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Uh, thank you. And now I would like to give the floor to Jan Kowalski, the director of the Pałac Saski. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the second Echoes of Antiqui conference. As a representative of the Saski Palace Company, which it is its co-organizer, it makes me proud to see here such a great representation of the world of science and culture. Once again, I warmly welcome you all and thank you for your presence. The second reason of my joy and pride is that although our company has been operating for only a year and a half, we have yet another opportunity to cooperate with such excellent partners as the Royal Łazienki Museum and the University of Warsaw. This time our cooperation relates to science. Although we have already worked with both institutions on the most important project for us, which is the reconstruction of Saski Palace, the Brill Palace and three tenement houses at Królewska Street, which will be mentioned during the conference. Finally, I'm very pleased 
with today's meeting because of its key idea, this ethos of antiquity. As you may know, the project carried out by our company includes reconstruction of the entire western part of one of the most important squares of Warsaw. As a result, the neoclassical Saski Palace and the Baroque Brill Palace, which was once called one of the most beautiful palaces of Poland, will be seen again at the Piłsudski Square. As a result of our work, the vitality, social functions, and echoes of antiquity will all return to this part of the center of Warsaw. I sincerely wish you, but also myself, that in a few years we'll be able to talk about the heritage of antiquity in the rebuilt Saski Palace. Thank you very much. very much for welcoming us and uh, I think we're right on time and we can uh, start the first panel. Uh, my name is uh, Michał Kuźmiński and I'm going to be the chairman of this one and I'm going to introduce to you now Dr. Juliet Harrison from Newman University who is going to be the keynote speaker and is going to open the uh, panel speaking about uh, reception of antiquity in books of Terry Pratchett. <laughs> Mac user trying to use a PC. <laughs> Lost the mouse. I will take responsibility for this one as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Michal and the other organizers, for inviting me to this incredibly beautiful place um, and asking me to open the conference. So, my name is Juliet Harrison. Uh, I am working on a project exploring the reception of ancient Greece and Rome in Terry Pratchett's Discworld, together with Martin Lindner from the University of Göttingen. Uh, so, uh, Martin had a look at my conclusions and offered his wise words on them as well, uh, since this is a joint project. So, for those of you unfamiliar, Terry Pratchett's Discworld is a series of 41 novels and various other spin-off media uh, set on the fantasy world of the Discworld. Uh, this is a flat world carried on the back of four elephants who stand on the back of a turtle. Uh, it is a comedic, humorous fantasy series, uh, started actually the year I was born in 1983 uh, and ending in 2015 with, sadly, the untimely death of Terry Pratchett. Uh, I think that's about all I have time to say for those of you unfamiliar with the Discworld. Hopefully you'll enjoy an introduction to the slightly um, madcap <laughs> world of the disc over the course of this paper. What I want to talk about is the relationship between the Discworld books, the classical world, classical texts, and uh, what C.W. Marshall, Marshall calls intermediate sources. This is the reception of ancient Greek and Roman texts or history or other things um, via something else <laughs> in between. It's part of Marshall's typology of reception. Now, the rest of his typology of reception uh, isn't something that I'm going to be talking about today, but it's based on uh, the degree of knowledge of classical material required or expected of a reader at the point of reception. So he suggests cosmetic reference, names as window dressing, a little bit like the Hunger Games. Indirect reference is what we're talking about today, using intermediary sources. Uh, then envisioning is historical fiction, basically. 
revisioning is uh, things like counter historical, uh, counterfactual history, things like that. Uh, and then engagement is kind of everything else. Uh, so we are focusing on this, this idea of an indirect reference where there's something classical or ancient, there's something else in between, and then the modern work references the in-between thing uh, as well as or instead of the actual ancient sources. So one example of this would be uh, the American film from the 1990s, She's All That. She's All That is a remake of My Fair Lady, which is a musical version of George Bernard Shaw's play Pygmalion, which takes its name from the story of Pygmalion in Ovid's Metamorphoses. So you can see there's numerous layers of reception, and I highly doubt viewers of She's All That were aware that it had any kind of root in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, I was a teenager, I was the target audience when that film came out. I don't think any of us had heard of Ovid's Metamorphoses. <laughs> so you can see how the actual classical original can be completely lost on many of the viewers. Slightly more detailed example, Robert Graves' 1930s novel, I, Claudius, has been incredibly influential on historical fiction set in the ancient world and even on fantasy fiction. So I, Claudius was adapted into a television series by the BBC in the 1970s. This was also incredibly influential. Uh, if we look at the BBC HBO TV series Rome from the noughties, which was telling the story of politics in first century uh, BCE Rome, they have responded to I, Claudius as much as they have responded to the actual history. We see this primarily in the representation of Augustus' mother, Artia, and of his wife, Livia, both of whom are characterized in the same way that his wife, Livia, was characterized in I, Claudius rather than in the actual history, although Tacitus hints at it. Uh, we see this similar thing again in George R. R. Martin's fantasy works. He loves I, Claudius. He thinks it's the best TV show ever. He's right. Uh, when he wrote A Song of Ice and Fire, his character Stannis Baratheon was partly inspired by the representation of Tiberius by George Baker in the television series of I, Claudius. How much that has anything to do with Tiberius's actual personality, again, is debatable. <laughs> um, uh, there is a level of intermediary reception in between the ancient source and the modern representation. So I'm going to look briefly at three case studies from the Discworld. These are three Discworld novels, Pyramids published in 1989, Eric in 1990, and Jingo in 1997. So Pyramids is set in the Discworld's version of ancient Egypt but it's Egypt as represented primarily in mummy movies, uh, those that came out up to 1989. <laughs> They're all fairly similar. Uh, Eric appears to be representation almost entirely by intermediary text, but actually there are more references to ancient sources in there than you might think at first. While Jingo relies on Percy by Shelley's poem Ozymandias for its impact, even though it looks like a direct classical reception. So I'm basically going to outline these three points in more detail over the next however long I've got, about 20 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me, so, uh, this is Pyramids. Um, Pyramids is set in the kingdom of Jelly Baby. When I was a teenager and first read this, I thought it was De Jelly Baby, and I didn't notice the footnote saying literally child of the gel. It's a British sweet, a jelly baby. This is the type of humor in the Discworld, for those who don't know the series. <laughs> so, uh, just go over here for a minute. You can see Jelly Baby is along that river <laughs> that goes, that river that goes down the middle of the map. Uh, so it is flanked by the countries of Sort and Ephibi. You will probably have guessed that Ephibi is basically ancient Greece. Uh, Sort stands for Troy. Uh, there's a whole sequence in the novel where Jelly Baby actually vanishes for a while and the Sortian War, i.e. Trojan War, nearly gets restarted. So it's this river kingdom, this very narrow river kingdom, in between two other countries inspired by the ancient world. Uh, ooh, here we <coughs> and the representation of, you know, inverted commas, Egypt, <laughs> jelly baby, um, in Discworld is very much uh, drawing on mummy movies. And I've used a movie from 1999 in the picture, but uh, really we're thinking about earlier mummy <laughs> movies that came out in the 80s. 
So we can see here, Pratchett describes it as Jelly Baby had been great once when upstarts like Zort and Ephebe were just a bunch of nomads with their towels on their heads. All that remained of those great days was the ruinously expensive palace, a few dusty ruins in the desert, and, and at this point the pharaoh sighed, the pyramids. Always the pyramids. His ancestors had been keen on pyramids, the pharaoh wasn't. Pyramids had bankrupted the country, drained it drier than ever the river did. The only curse they could afford to put on a tomb these days was bugger off. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with <laughs> ancient Egypt, there are not actually all that many pyramids in ancient Egypt. There are a few that are extremely famous. There's far more royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings than there are pyramids. But in the disc world, Jelly Baby has been completely taken over by pyramids and the entire riverbanks are just flanked by uh, thousands of pyramids. And it's taking the popular conception of ancient Egypt and the conception of ancient Egypt seen in mummy movies. The novel goes on to uh, talk about, uh, it says, what would happen uh, if our ancestors were here today? What would they say? And he says, what they would say is, it's dark in here. And at the end of the novel, all of the mummies do, of course, come to life and break out of their pyramids. Um, so it's really playing with the tropes of mummy movies, uh, far more than it is playing with anything relating to actual ancient Egyptian history. There are some references to actual Egyptian history. So Pratchett was extremely well read and he doesn't kind of, it's not that he only knows Egypt from mummy movies. So there are references to the real ancient world in there. There's biblical references. Uh, for example, uh, Jelly Baby really was a small self-centered kingdom. Even its plagues were half-hearted. All self-respecting river kingdoms have vast supernatural plagues, but the best the old kingdom had been able to achieve in the last hundred years was the plague of frog singular, as opposed to frogs. Um, not much of a plague if there's only one frog. Uh, he also has classical references in there, so Pratchett knew his classical literature. And we can see here a description of uh, Tepic uh, putting on the mask that the pharaoh wears. Tepic, uh, Tepic is the new pharaoh. Tepic peered out through the eye slots. It was certainly a handsome face. It smiled faintly. He remembered his father visiting the nursery one day and forgetting to take it off. Tepic had screamed the place down. And we can hear echoes of Homer's Iliad here, the famous scene where Hector leans down to kiss his baby son and he's got a helmet on and the baby cries. So there are definitely references to ancient sources in there, but they are somewhat overwhelmed by uh, the reception of the intermediary source that is the mummy movies. Moving on to Eric. <coughs> Excuse me. So Eric looks at first glance like it is dealing entirely with an intermediary source. What I've shown you here is um, front covers <laughs> of Eric. And the more recent ones, you can't see this so well. But if you look at the older ones, uh, sorry, step away from the mic for a minute. You can see on the cover is the word South crossed out and replaced with the word Eric. I don't know why they've stopped doing this on the more recent ones. There's probably an interesting angle to explore there. Uh, possibly they don't think anyone has heard of Dr. Faustus anymore either. Um, but as you can see from the original uh, 1980s and then the 1990s covers, uh, Eric is a spoof specifically of Christopher Marlowe's play, Dr. Faustus, uh, to the extent that the word Faust has been crossed out. Uh, and the story follows a teenager called Eric who tries to summon a demon to grant him wishes, but gets the inept wizard Rincewind instead. Eric wishes to rule all the kingdoms of the world, to meet the most beautiful woman ever, and to live forever. And of course, it's the most beautiful woman uh, who is the point of classical reception. When he wishes to meet the most beautiful woman ever, he and Rincewind are taken to the Tzortian War, that stand-in for the Trojan War, and they meet Eleanor of Tzort, who is standing in for Helen of Troy. However, Eric is a bit disappointed. <laughs> it turns out that Eleanor of Tzort is 20 years older than she was when she ran off, uh, has had numerous children, and is not quite as beautiful as he was expecting. And you can see here the direct comparison between Marlowe's Dr. Faustus and the Discworld version <laughs> of the same scene. Faustus says, you know, he wants uh, that heavenly Helen who I saw of late, uh, Mephistopheles uh, grants him this wish. Helen turns up <laughs> and Faustus sees her and says, 
Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. In the Discworld version, uh, they meet Eleanor. Eric is extremely disappointed by her looks. Uh, and Rinswin says, it's what they call dramatic necessity. No one's going to be interested in a war fought over a quite pleasant lady, moderately attractive in a good light, are they? But it said her face launched a thousand ships. That's what you call a metaphor, said Rincewind, and the sergeant explains, lying. Anyway, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the classics, Rincewind added. They never check their facts. They're just out to sell legends. So although it looks like Eric isn't dealing entirely with Dr. Faustus, actually there are numerous uh, references to classical literature embedded within Eric as well. And there are even more layers of perception brought in by the fact that it is an illustrated novel. It's illustrated by Josh Kirby. And we have yet more layers of perception and more intermediary sources. Uh, so <coughs> Eleanor is prompted of looking in a slightly faded way in the text. And Eric thinks she looks like his mum. But Josh Kirby's illustration looks like William Hogarth's Gin Lane, which is a, a famous <coughs> image uh, demonstrating uh, the terrible morals of the lower classes. That you can see the similarity between Eleanor uh, over there and Gin Lane over there. Uh, and just for contrast, these are two of the many actresses who have played Helen of Troy over the years. As you can see, uh, they do not look anything like uh, the illustration of Eleanor of Thought. But we do see then many more references to classical literature as well. So we have uh, some talk of Alexander and some of Hercules. Interesting references to actual Earth classical characters, which is extremely rare in the Discworld. Uh, great names such as these. Throughout the history of the multiverse, people have said nice things about every cauliflower-eared sword swinger, at least in their vicinity, on the basis it is a lot safer that way. At the end of the novel, uh, the narrator tells us, the people of Thought and of Phoebe were happy, at least the ones who write and feature in the dramas of history were happy, which is all that mattered. Now their long war was over and they could get on with the proper concern of civilized nations, which is to prepare for the next one. So there's a lot of references to myth-making, legends, to classical uh, myth and poetry and tropes coming through. We also meet Laviolus. The name translates as Rincer of Winds, and he is apparently Rincewind's ancestor. This is Odysseus, but he doesn't look or sound much like Odysseus, as we've come to expect him. He didn't look like a soldier at all. He had the armor, which was tarnished, and he had the helmet, which looked as though its plume had been used as a paintbrush, but he was skinny and had all the military bearing of a weasel. Basically, Pratchett has taken Odysseus's brain over brawn approach to extremes. Laviolus says, I was afraid the gods might have a grudge against me. They get a bit angry if you go around thinking up ideas like wooden horses and tunnels. They're traditionalists, you know. They prefer people just to hack at one another, and there's a whole ongoing joke where um, Rincewind obviously knows the stories, uh, and Laviolus keeps saying, have the gods got a grudge against me? Am I going to get home quickly? And Rincewind is like, yes, you'll be fine. <laughs> this is obviously the Discworld version of Odysseus. Rincewind knows that, yes, the gods do have a grudge against him. It's going to take him a very long time to get home, but he doesn't actually tell him. All of this is obviously aimed at people who are familiar with the classical sources, who maybe have read Homer or a summary of Homer, um, who are aware of the stories around Odysseus. So despite appearances, Eric is actually interacting quite directly with classical sources as well as the intermediary source that is Dr. Faustus. Finally, hoping I'm doing okay for time, <laughs> final case study is Jingo. So Jingo uh, was published in the late 90s. It is a story about war and warfare, so the fact that it was published in the late 90s is obviously, um, it was published at a time that was quite peaceful in the UK, uh, more or less, um, which is probably quite relevant in understanding what Pratchett says about war in it. But anyway, it's basically about trying to prevent a war uh, between the city of Ankh-Morpork and the country of Clatch. Uh, basically, a sunken island called Leship has re-emerged from the waters, and there has been an attempted assassination of Clatchian Prince Kufura, obviously echoing the actual assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, so Vimes, who is the commander of the City Watch in Ankh-Morpork, is desperately trying to prevent a war following this assassination attempt. He's given an old book by the librarian of Unseen University, which is called 
and I'm going to use uh, the wrong pronunciation, but the one that British people use, Vene Vidi Viki. <laughs> I know it should be Vene Vidi Viki. Uh, <laughs> Vene Vidi Viki, A Soldier's Life by General A. Tacticus. I actually thought Tacitus was called Tacticus when I was a teenager. So, in the story, uh, a long time previously, Ankh-Morpork had ruled a huge empire, largely thanks to General Tacticus. They then sent him to the kingdom of Genoa, um, and he ended up fighting against Ankh-Morpork because he went to Genoa, assessed the greatest military threat to Genoa, and decided it was Ankh-Morpork, and waged war on his own city. Uh, so they are now slightly ashamed of him. Uh, but Vines finds his book very helpful and reads it a lot. Tacticus is not a very honorable fighter, but effective. His advice on avoiding defeat when outnumbered, outweaponed, and outpositioned is don't have a battle. Since Vimes is trying to prevent a war, he thinks that is good advice. He thinks the Tacticus method of fighting is how policemen have always fought. And Tacticus also has some similarities to Laviolus, but much less cowardly. Tacticus is much more modeled on Alexander and Julius Caesar blended together. Uh, Tacticus is all in favor of war. <laughs> He's uh, certainly not afraid of fighting. Um, uh, is tactical. He won't fight unless he thinks he can win, as opposed to Laviolus, uh, who is afraid and wants to avoid fighting because he doesn't want to fight. Throughout the novel, Vimes follows the general's advice and starts to admire him. Uh, on the subject of Veni Vidi Vici, or Veni Vidi Wiki, as a comment, it always struck Vimes as a bit too pat. It wasn't the sort of thing you came up with on the spur of the moment, was it? He'd probably spent long evenings in his tent, looking up in the dictionary, short words beginning with V and trying them out. He probably made them up first and then went off to see somewhere and conquer it. So Vimes has a sort of grudging admiration for Tacticus, uh, even though he thinks some of what Tacticus writes is a bit dubious. But his opinion of Tacticus changes toward the end of the novel when he finds the remains of a statue Tacticus had put up for himself. So, as I said, Tacticus is very much a combination of Julius Caesar and Alexander. And you can see Caesar, obviously, <laughs> any weedy weeky. And the general fondness for conquering fits both of them. Um, but like Alexander, he also had a fondness for founding cities named after himself and putting up great big statues of himself. So Vimes meets his counterpart, the Clachian policeman 71 Hour Ahmed, in a deserted city built by Tacticus when he tried to conquer Clach. Ahmed says, it was supposed to make the point, here we are and here we stay, but then the wind changed. Also, of course, Alexander's empire did not last anything like as long as Caesar's. So the switch from Tacticus as Caesar to Tacticus as Alexander uh, has an impact on how we view his empire building as well. Vimes finds the remains of a statue, only the feet are left, with the inscription, Ab hoc possum videre domum tuum. I can see your house from here. <laughs> Ahmed identifies this as both a boast and a threat. This is a turning point. Vimes realizes he's fallen into the trap of admiring a great man who wasn't a great man at all. He was a warmonger. He was all in favor of the very thing Vimes is trying to stop. He was starting wars for no reason, conquering people for no reason. And Vimes realizes the mistake he's made in admiring this man. And this statement on this statue where only the feet are left, obviously the inscription is in Latin, <laughs> but it really refers more to Percy Bysshe Shelley's famous poem, Ozymandias. So this is a very well-known English poem. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So Pratchett is expecting his readers to have some familiarity with this poem. I mean, you don't have to. I didn't the first time I read it. I didn't know anything about Caesar, Alexander, Percy by Shelley. I was about 14. So <laughs> you don't have to know these things. 
but he's obviously anticipating that a certain number of his readers will have familiarity with this poem because the description of the statue very clearly echoes the statue of Ozymandias with only the feet remaining. And this similar sentiment, it's less poetic than uh, look on my works, ye mighty and despair, uh, but I can see your house from here as both a boast and a threat. You know, look at my works, I'm so mighty, I can see your house and also I can destroy your house. So, just a few conclusions to finish off with. We can see that the relationship between classical sources, intermediary text, and modern reception is quite flexible. It fluctuates between the different novels. And it's also very dependent on the reader themselves. If I go back briefly <laughs> to the, sorry, <laughs> to, to Marshall's typology of reception, the reason I like Marshall's uh, typology is that it is based on the degree of knowledge expected or required of the reader rather than the degree of knowledge possessed by the author. Authors are usually pretty well read, and if authors are going to write something that makes fun of ancient Greece, they're probably going to read at least a book on ancient Greece before they do it. But readers are not required to do that. Say, I started reading Discworld books when I was 13 years old. I had no idea what any of it was. But when you're writing comedy, when you're writing something that spoofs things, then you need your reader to have some level of knowledge of what it is you're making fun of. Um, so there is an expectation that readers have some idea what Pratchett is on about, but it varies a bit between the different novels. And also, readers with different levels of knowledge will get different things out of the novels. So Pyramids, the earliest, is especially concerned with the idea of ancient Egypt via movies. It does have some intertextual references to Egypt itself, particularly biblical references, which people would know better. Uh, but it really expects readers to know the movies more than ancient Egypt. Eric is more of a mixture. It looks like a reception primarily of the intermediary text, Dr. Faustus, but actually it interacts with ancient texts quite a bit, and it's as much about myth-making and imperfect narratives as anything else. In Jingo, Tacticus stands for Romans and for Alexander the Great, and he stands for warmongering in general, but the payoff of his story relates to Shelley and Ozymandias more than Caesar or Tacitus or the other inspiration for the character Sun Tzu, about whom I know nothing other than he wrote a book about warfare, which is uh, <laughs> also part of the inspiration for Tacticus. Um, but that payoff really relates to Ozymandias more than any details about Caesar or Alexander. Pratchett was, I should say, well read enough that all of his classical receptions refer back to the ancient world directly in some way. He knows his ancient history, and you can see that coming through in the books, but the readers aren't necessarily so well read. So he creates different levels of classical references, which means readers can enjoy the books whether they get 20%, 50%, or 80% of the jokes. And he gets the balance between the intermediary receptions, the direct receptions, and simple jokes so that you can understand them, whatever level of knowledge you're coming in with. It's not so much that the intermediary text is primary, the way Marshall suggested, it's more that different readers read Pratchett's text in different ways, depending on their own level of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we will have the discussion after the, the whole panel, so uh, thank you very much once again for a very interesting uh, presentation. I think that um, if someone didn't, didn't read uh, Pratchett's book uh, until now, they, they are very much encouraged after, after your uh, speech. And uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, Terne Thorsten, um, who is a PhD candidate from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, with a presentation entitled Cultural Heritage as a Target in Wars and Conflicts. Hi, um, my name is Tana Torsen. I'm a PhD candidate at 
the University of Copenhagen at the Department of Arts and Cultural Studies. Um, my PhD project is called Breaking and Creating, the Contemporary Iconoclasm of the Islamic State, uh, and it seeks to create... Is it close? Is this fine? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and it seeks to create a theoretical framework on contemporary iconoclasm by analyzing the Islamic State's acts of destruction and placing them in a historical use of iconoclasm. Um, so I'll just briefly, brief, briefly inform you that I will be showing some images uh, that the Islamic State has produced. Uh, many of you have probably seen some of them, but I'd just like to make that obvious uh, to everyone before I start. So I'll first give you some background for my project, uh, and then I'll move on to an examination of uh, the images of the destruction of the Temple of Bel and the Temple of Bel Shamin in Palmyra. Uh, and lastly, I will say something about the relationship between the destruction of the temples, the images offered, and the aesthetic strategy of the Islamic State as expressed through their international online magazine, Debik. So. Yes, um, my approach to the Islamic State's iconoclasm uh, is in part inspired by Finn Barberi Flood's 2002 analysis of the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, by, the, yeah, by the Taliban in 2001. In his, in his analysis, Flood argued that the destruction of the Buddhas was, quote, not a timeless response to figuration, but a calculated engagement with a culturally specific discourse of images at a particular historic moment. At the time of their destruction, the Buddhas was not being worshipped as religious icons, and the statue had already been defaced, thus living up to the long-standing tradition according to which defacements make figurative images acceptable to those who would otherwise oppose them. The Buddhas had, however, been used in processes of modernization and nation-building, and their image had, for example, appeared on Afghan post stamps. Um, the Buddhas had thereby been transformed from a pre-modern religious icon into an iconic symbol of the modern nation-state, uh, rendering the act of destruction into a political act and not only uh, a religious <laughs> gesture. Um, Flood's analysis challenged the prevalent and extremely one-dimensional assumption that the destruction of the Buddhas represented Islam's medieval hostilities towards any, t any type of figuration. Um, and by suggesting that the destruction was not only rooted in religion, but also distinctly political, Flood unfolded some of the many and complex attitudes to figuration that can and do exist simultaneously. In the case of the Buddhas, despite the Taliban's religious rhetoric, according to Flood, a good case can be made that what was at stake was not the literal worship of religious idols, but their veneration as cultural icons. This suggested that the role afforded specific objects, artifacts and images as symbols can heighten their vulnerability by producing them as targets for those who oppose what they represent. This is corroborated by researchers in critical cultural heritage, such as Lynn Meskel and Frederick Rosin, who have shown that the efforts to protect cultural heritage against the harms of wars and conflicts sometimes contributes to make the same heritage more vulnerable. The selective classification um, of certain monuments as having universal value for UNESCO World Heritage status further amplifies the capacity um, of threats and violence to generate outrage and thus publicity on the global stage, which undoubtedly enhances the value as potential targets. Um, one of the most prominent targets of the Islamic State's destruction was the site of Palmyra, that had been inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List since uh, 1980. When the Islamic States first seized the city in May 2015, they claimed that they would not touch the an ancient monuments, but only the statues. As the Islamic State's position on this changed, they started to destroy uh, Palmyra's monument. The, their religious motives were questioned. <coughs> Sorry. Um, as the archaeologist and architectural historian uh, Umur Hamansa writes, the production of the videos uh, and photographic imagery that presents us with ISIS horrendous acts of violence, whether against human bodies, sacred buildings, 
cultural heritage and archaeological sites and museum antiquities are often the real purpose of their interest. This posed the questions. If the images produced to document the destruction um, or if the destruction were done to create the images. Harman Saab proposed that the Islamic State's acts of destruction are not a chroniclasm and that they should not be viewed as such. He suggests that if the Islamic State's acts are considered iconoclastic, then it follows that the groups believe that the objects they destroy are animated uh, and pose a threat to their religious practice. This, however, I do not believe is the case. Uh, on the contrary, I believe um, that viewing the actions as part of the history of iconoclasm is an extremely important perspective. I would even go as far as to say, thank you, <laughs> um, that to not consider the Islamic State's acts as iconoclastic is to take them out of their historic context and view them as isolated events. Opposed to Hamansa, I do not see the performativity of the acts as disqualifying of the iconoclasm label but as a representative or of a development in the way that iconoclasm is being used. So following flood, my approach to iconoclasm is to view iconoclastic events uh, as an engagement with a culturally specific discourse of images at a particular moment in history and to quote, historicize the event, acknowledge the agency of the actor, examine their motivation and interrogate the narrative of which we depend for our information. I'll now turn to uh, the images that the Islamic State has produced of the destruction of cultural heritage. And I want to take a closer look at the images of the destruction of the Temple of Bel and the Temple of Bel Shamin that was published uh, in the Islamic State's international online magazine, Dabik, in 2015. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> Um, so the photo report of, uh, in the beak is a double spread um, with a report of the destruction of Belgemin on the left and the destruction of Bell on the right. Both reports consist of uh, seven photographs and is presented almost uh, like a cartoon with a clear chronological narrative that shows the temples before, during and after the destruction. In the Belgemin report, the first four images, if you look from the top left reading to the right. Uh, these are preparation images uh, that are showing the faceless fighters carrying barrels of explosive and placing them in and around the temple. The next two images shows the during phase and picture the temple in mid-destruction while the last image um, is of the rubble left of the temple. Reading again from the top left to the right, the report of the Temple of Bell also has the first four images as the before stages, the next two of the destruction, and the last images is after the destruction, showing a lone gateway in the middle of the rubble from the destroyed temple. So in both the case of the Temple of Bell and the Temple of Belshamin, parts of the structures were still standing after the explosions. Based on the Islamic State's iconoclasm, Art historian Lamia Balafry has suggested that the possibility of photographing and filming iconoclastic actions has changed the way that objects are being destroyed. Uh, and she argues that because the process of destruction can now be captured, it limits the need for leaving the material damaged but intact to then tell the story of the iconoclastic events that has taken place. This, however, does not seem to be the case with the destruction of the two temples. While the Islamic State has been extremely destructive and used both explosives and bulldozers, at least in this case, they did not obliterate the structures completely, but left part of them still standing. Um, a row of column is standing after the destruction of the Temple of Bell, and a lone gateway is standing after the explosion of the Temple of Bell. It can, of course, be argued that the structures were not left to make a point and that it was just a coincidence that they were not brought down with the rest of the temples. However, in both cases, the lone columns in front of the explosions and amongst the rubble arguably create a stronger image than if they had not been there. 
Without them, the single image would be harder to read. To an untrained eye, whether from an ancient temple or, say, an office building, rubble kind of just looked like rubble. Uh, but with the column in the middle of the piles, while the dust is still settling, the image is now recognizable as something of great w value being destroyed. This is also in line with the lessons learned from the video that the Islamic State produced from Mosul Museum. The video that was released about six months prior to these images had a far broader and more global audience than the previous images that the group has created. And while there are many reasons for this, an important one is that the images from inside the museum was easily read uh, as the museum space is recognizable as such. Some of the previous videos showed uh, the Islamic State's destroying buildings and structures uh, that was far less recognizable and required more context to be read and therefore had a smaller audience and fewer reactions. The columns play a prominent role in articulating the destruction and its impact. Uh, the larger image of Balshamin show that the temple was lined with barrel of explosive. However, when we see the explosive go off, we see the temple from a different angle. The photographer has not just taken a few steps, steps back for safety, but has gone to a different side of the temple to record the destruction, a side where the columns stand between the photographer and the exploding temple. And this is what you can see in the image to your far left. Um, yeah. Um, and to me, this suggests that the photographer was aware of the effect that the column had on the photos, as the images would be radically different if the columns had been blown up as well, or if they didn't show in the photo. Um, and this indicates that the Islamic State's production of images have affected the destruction of heritage site. It also suggested by the similarities between the images in the two reports, especially in the last three images uh, of both reports where you see uh, in both cases a dark cl cloud rising um, and then a lighter smoke cloud with columns in front of it and at last a sole row of columns among the rubble. <coughs> this also thematically fits overall with the narrative and aesthetics of uh, Den Peak. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the aesthetic st strategy of showing something recognizable amidst destruction or decay as a way to contextualize the destruction is also the strategy behind uh, disaster movies like these, uh, which we know the Islamic State has been inspired by, um, including uh, other movies and video games like Call of Duty and uh, Assassin's Creed. So you kind of see the aesthetics here in the front pages of the book. Um, so the remaining columns of the two temples also allude to the Islamic State discursive narrative that cast the West as Romans and Crusaders and generally refers to the West as Rome, especially in De Pique. Uh, the magazine um, uh, gets its name from the northern city, uh, uh, De Pique, uh, where, the, where in the seventh century Armageddon was prophesied to play out in an apocalyptic battle with infidel forces from the Roman Empire and derives what, much of its symbolism from this. So in this light, I read the destruction of the temples of Balshamin as a part of the Islamic State's apocalyptic, apocalyptic narrative as Rome, or more accurately, the idea of Rome, plays such a big role in the Islamic State's storytelling and in their understanding of their trajectory. I read the temples as part of the, uh, the Greco-Roman monuments of Palmyra as symbols of the ancient and the new Rome, uh, the West, uh, and the destruction of them as a proxy attack on the West and the global institutions, mainly UNESCO, that has been unable to prevent the destruction. In this reading, the temples function as symbols of cultural heritage rather than of polytheism. While they could be categorized as idolatry in their function as ancient site of worship, through heritization, the temple has been culturally redefined from religious site to cultural heritage site. Am I all right? I th okay. okay. Uh, this has not gone uh, unnoticed by the Islamic State, uh, who through the, uh, though they referenced or referred to the temple as uh, idolatry, 
the group's concept of idolatry is not limited to what traditionally would be considered idolatry within Islam, but is, but is extended to what the group has described as idols of nationalism and idols of democracy. Um, the Islamic State's view of antiquities is a result of a specific reading of Islam, but it's also reflective of a broader and more complex relationship with a cultural heritage that since its unearthing has been co-opted by both imperialistic and nationalistic projects. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for this very interesting although rather sad presentation. Uh, and now I would like to um, uh, introduce Dr. Valeria Pitenina from the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in Kiev, who is going to um, present. She, she's not, she hasn't arrived yet. Okay, let's hope she's going to arrive um, later. Yes, sure, 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 sure. Okay, so uh, I will ask uh, the next person now, uh, Dr. Maciej Paprocki from the University of Wrocław uh, with the presentation, uh, Compassionate, Careless, Cruel, Divergent Receptions of Tetis in Select Modern Greek Myth Retellings. Just give me a moment because I wasn't prepared, so I haven't actually opened my presentation. I'll be right here. Yes. Uh, no, no, I just need to open my file. Mm -hmm. Okay. Much. Uh, first things first, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me a chance to speak to you and I'm really happy to be here in Warsaw in this beautiful place. And I would like to talk to you today about Thetis. Uh, when we think of Achilles' mother, Thetis, power is usually not the first thing that comes to our minds. Within the Iliad, the narrated goddess unsuccessfully tries to protect her demigod son from death, even though she knows Achilles is fated to die at Troy. However, when considered in greater detail, Thetis's mythical biography reveals her complex nature and authority. Laura Slatkin's uh, 1991 book, The Power of Thetis, demonstrates that this ostensibly marginal and powerless goddess drives the plot of the Iliad, being able to directly petition Zeus to change the course of war. Holding a mysterious sway over Zeus, Thetis is, as Slatkin argues, elusively credited with the power to uphold or challenge the rule of the king of the gods. Surviving sources beyond the Iliad flesh out Thetis's ambiguous character. Foretold to bear a son stronger than his father, Thetis saves Zeus from bonds clapped on upon him by other Olympians. A great beauty, Thetis attracts roaming eyes of both Zeus and Poseidon, who quarrel over her. At one point, Thetis departs from the Olympus to live in the sea with her aunt, primordial Oceanid Eurynome, becoming Hephaestus' foster mother and Dionysus' protectress. Due to Zeus's machinations, the power Thetis eventually ends in an unhappy union with, excuse me, it's not a conference without technical difficulties, sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, Thetis eventually ends in an unhappy marriage with mortal Peleus, utterly unable to save her son from death. Thetis's twisting mythical biography translates to marked ambivalence in her post-classical reception. She is alternatively portrayed as supporter or opponent of Zeus's regime, 
model bride or unwilling victim of Peleus's rape, good mother or child murderess, figure of comedy or monstrous witch. The following presentation analyzes receptions of Thetis in four modern Greek myth retellings. A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, The God Beneath the Sea by Leon Garfield and Edward Blishen, Cyrena by Donna Jo Napoli, and The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. Each author highlights another aspect of Thetis's complex personality. From Haynes's bleak despair, Garfield and Blishen's forethought and kindness, Napoli's aggrieved indifference, to Miller's cruelty and determination to better her lot. I argue that these ostensibly divergent receptions of Thetis taken together make up a matrix of polarities employed by ancient and modern authors alike to reinvent this adaptable narrate. Within the divine society, Thetis occupies an ostensibly inferior position. Yet, she is simultaneously said to have once held means of supplanting Zeus due to her potential of bearing a son stronger than his father. Intriguingly, individual ancient authors either retold or invented narratives in which Thetis endeavored to contest Zeus's supremacy. Appraised on her power and agency, Thetis gives the impression of being a surprisingly well-connected goddess, weaving her way into multiple mythical narratives and capturing the attention of numerous early authors. Depending on author's views, Thetis shows great differences in character, some of which you can see on the screen. For example, when married off to Peleus, Thetis either actively hates Peleus, resists him, and gets raped by him, or she morosely accepts her fate, or even, according to, Euripid to Euripides' unusual twist of the traditional tale, she supports Peleus and promi promises to make him immortal and share his bed. This rather surprising Euripidean development exemplifies the inherent ambiguity in, of Thetis's character, highlighting that ancient authors exploited Thetis's ostensibly incompatible traits to reinvent her. If the Iliad underscores Thetis's former power and current powerlessness, then other works may Thetis undulate between devoted and yet disloyal, subordinate and ultimately subversive. Text by text, Thetis switches her divided loyalties, from Hera to Zeus to Hephaestus to Dionysus, as she sees, fi as she sees fit. Similarly, the capricious narrate can help or harm, be caring or cruel. In the Iliad and the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, Thetis tenderly protects Achilles and is said to have once rescued young Hephaestus and Dionysus. In contrast, Thetis in the pseudo hesiodic Agimus Apollonius's Argonautica and Lycophron's Alexandra remains so profoundly preoccupied with purging Achilles of his mortality in the fire that she does not care whether the child di dies in the process. All divergent reiterations of Thetis taken together make up a matrix of extreme polarities, ancient authors employed to continuously rewrite different aspects of her character. A maiden, a wife, a lover, a mother, a witch, a goddess, a monster, an animal, an excess of potential. In this presentation, I consider how four modern retellings depict Thetis, with each of them focusing on different traits of the narrate and thus presenting a staggeringly different picture of the sea goddess. I begin with Natalie Haynes' uh, 2019 book, A Thousand Ships. Powerfully told from an all-female perspective, Natalie Haynes puts the women, girls, and goddesses at the center of the story in the Iliad showing how no woman, no matter how powerful, can escape the tangled threads of fate in the patriarchal world of ancient Greek myth. Hainus's Thetis emphasizes the goddess's powerlessness and dejection. Indeed, we get to know Thetis as she weeps for the lot that befell her. Forced to marry against her will and birth a mortal child, Thetis in a thousand ships is full of bitter regret and even as she struggles to help Achilles, she recognizes the futility of her efforts Thetis's portrayal in the book aligns with the generally bleak tone of Highness's narration. The Greek myth led little agency to women and Thetis's despair. Markedly, in an interview with the NPR, Highness said that one inspiration for writing this novel came from a documentary about restorative justice in Rwanda. And I quote, it doesn't look to me like these women are receiving any kind of justice. It looks like they're having to tolerate what they're given because there is no alternative. That theme ran through the writing, a thousand ships for me, end of quote. Even so, 
Thetis and Hyena's vision gets no justice because nothing can be done against the will of Zeus. Another retelling considered in this presentation is The God Beneath the Sea by Leon Garfield and Edward Blishen. Ch this children's novel based on a Greek mythology tells the story of newborn Hephaestus, the titular God Beneath the Sea, who was cast from the Mount Olympus by his mother Hera. Having fallen into the sea, he is saved and raised in secret by Thetis and Eurynome, who tell him various Greek creation myths. The novel continues with myths of the Olympians and the age of gods and mortals, and concludes with Hephaestus returning to Olympus, having been cast down a second time after reproaching Zeus. Garfield and Blishen highlight Thetis's forethought and kindness. She is shown as a perfect maternal figure and contrasted against violent and cruel Hera. One beautiful scene in the novel concerns the creation of a brooch depicting a sea nymph and her lover. Wrought by Hephaestus, this beautiful yet violent brooch stands for Thetis and the narrative, since both the brooch and Thetis framed the novel and set it ev its events in motion. Thetis begins the story by saving Hephaestus, while the brooch eventually brought to Olympus reveals Hephaestus' presence to the Olympians and starts the narrative arc of his ascension and second downfall. The third retelling discussed in this presentation, Sirena by Donna Jill Napoli, weaves the tragic love story between a mermaid and a mortal for young readers. When the titular Sirena meets Philoctetes, Hercules' friend, who is left on Lemnos during the Trojan War, she falls in love. But the young warrior must return home to fight the Trojan War and leave his love behind, with many gods working towards this end. One of Cyrena's antagonists is her adoptive mother, the Orcaeanid Doris, here called Dora, who, together with her narrate daughters, wishes to keep Serena and Philoctetes apart. Among Dora's retinue, we find her daughter Thetis, whom Doris praises for marrying Peleus and birthing glorious Achilles. Compared to Amphitrite, who is happy in her marriage to Poseidon, lord of the sea, Thetis feigns indifference but is visibly uneasy about her fate. In the final part of the novel, Thetis visits Serena and beseeches her to release Philoctetes so that Troy may fall and Achilles is avenged. Yet, Serena recognizes that Thetis's plea will, uh, will encumber Serena with the same bitterness that befell Thetis. Eventually, she agrees, but for Philoctetes' sake, not for Thetis. Serena recognizes, Th recognizes Thetis's marital misery and doomed fate, but she also sees her indifference and trickery with the narrate paying forward the hurt that was once done to her. The final book discussed in this presentation, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, retells Homer's Iliad from the perspective of Patroclus, with focus on Patroclus's romantic relationship with Achilles. Thetis is one of the book's key antagonists, and she looks really terrifying in this book, as you can see uh, on one of the image renderings of her. She is monstrous, impossibly tall. She smells like seawater laced with dark brown honey, with her voice being hoarse and raspy, like grinding the, of rocks in the surf, and her eyes all black, flecked with gold. From Patroclus' perspective, Thetis is frightening, cold, and cruel, more a horrific ghostly apparition rather than a goddess. Thetis disapproves of Achilles' love for Patroclus, and she uses her great power to keep them apart constantly belittling Patroclus and reminding him that she could kill him with ease. In Miller's vision, Thetis's key traits are her cunning, cruelty, and determination to fight for her loved ones. She constantly tries to immortalize Achilles and opposes Olympian gods whether they want to send Achilles to Troy. Notably, the book does not shy from stressing the fact that Thetis survived a terrible ordeal. She was raped by Peleus and embroiled in a loveless marriage. Thetis never seeks to elicit sympathy from other characters, instead working tirelessly to achieve her ends. Thetis' love of Achilles is her sole redeeming quality in Miller's retelling. After Patroclus' death, she is finally moved by his devotion to her dead son. In a moment of compassion, Thetis adds Patroclus' name to the tomb of Achilles, and he and Achilles reunite in the afterlife. Having discussed four modern myth retellings that feature Thetis, I argue that ancient and modern authors alike present the narrate in a multitude of ways, highlighting different aspects of her mythical biography to bring to the four traits that they want to emphasize. 
If Keynes focuses on Thetis's understandable sadness, then Garfield and Blishen underscore Thetis's kindness and caring nature, with both traits well attested in the Iliad. In turn, Donna Jo Napoli and Madeline Miller highlight darker aspects of Thetis, her indifference to suffering, her determination, and even cruelty, with Miller perhaps coming closest to showing Thetis's raw power detected by Laura Slotkin in the Iliad. Curiously enough, it appears that modern authors are unable to reconcile different visions of Thetis in a single depiction. If Thetis is powerless, then she cannot be powerful, and if she is caring, then she cannot be cruel. I mentioned that these ostensibly divergent receptions of Thetis taken together make up polarities employed by ancient and modern authors alike to reinvent her. These extremes in her characterization, I argue, point to certain essential ambiguity in Thetis's character, with her kindness always tinged with danger. In words of Emma Aston, and I quote here, on land, Thetis might look like a fair-skinned woman of great beauty, but she contains within her the murk of the sea from which she comes. Her ability, suddenly to metamorphose from lovely goddess to terrifying one, reminds us perhaps of the motive of the pale squid, when angered, ejecting black ink. Thetis's lovel loveliness is not to be relied upon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. And in the meantime, uh, I've seen that uh, Dr. Pitanina has joined us. Uh, we are very glad that you did, that you managed. Uh, your, your flight was delayed, right? But you, but you managed to, to um, arrive. We, we're very happy to, to welcome you, and especially we're very happy to have the um, Ukrainian uh, scholars with us today and tomorrow. Um, yes, yes, yes. yes. many doors <laughs> uh, reading and uh, show you my presentation no 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 it's good huh? you can change slides with that no 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 it's 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 good i i see and i show it Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my presentation today is dedicated to Ukraine translation and illustration of ancient Greek literature. My presentation today is dedicated to Ukraine translation and illustration of ancient Greek literature. Sorry for my English, it's not very good, but I try. Translation of uh, ancient Greek works into Ukraine appeared relatively late. The widely known works of Khmer become available to the Ukrainian language audience only in 19th century, very, very late. important task within this period uh, I 
about men's instinctual. Uh, work to translate world literature into Ukrainian, making it accessible for reading, studying, and educational for prose. For example, the famous writer, Ukrainian writer Ivan Franko, translated the work of Adam Mickiewicz, and in this period, translations of work by Goethe, Shakespeare, Cervantes, and other big writers. In uh, 1880, uh, Stefan Rudansky and uh, Vasil Samilenko made several partial translations of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. Uh, this was the first attempt to translate works of ancient Greek literature in Ukrainian language. The first complete translation of Gomer's Odyssey into Ukrainian was published in Lviv in 1889. You can show this mm, book. Um, the translation of uh, Homer was a poet, conductor, and graduate of the theological faculty of Athens University. It was Petro Nishinsky who used the pseudonym Petro Balda. Uh, Petro Balda, show it. Yes. Uh, Nishinsky worked as a Greek uh, language teacher in Kiev and Odessa. And later in Odessa, he published a journal dedicated to ancient Greek culture in 19th century. The translated save the rhythmic structure of the original text and translated it into hexameter in the Ukrainian language and write about this in this book. Um, this modestly designed, not illustration book, now is very rare edition, even in our library and in our museum. Uh, but you can see a uh, link and uh, you can uh, see all this book in, uh, uh, in library, electronic library. Um, Petro Nishinsky also translated Antigone, Sophocles, uh, and Iliade, Homer. It was in 19th century. Uh, he also translated the medieval Slavianic poem, The Tale of Igor's Campaign, into the Greek, Greek language. It was the first translate this poem to Greek language. Uh, Nishinsky's translation remained to only once until the middle of 20th century. After, <coughs> after the First World War, publication of ancient Greek literature very rare. This did not mean that the ancient team was excluded from the cultural context. It found its place on theater, uh, theatrical stages. And in uh, 1918, the Young Theater in Kyiv, under the direction of Les Kurbas and artist Anatoly Petritsky, staged King Edin. And you can show pictures from this. a new edition of Sophocles, Antigona, was published in Hart. This book was one of the few illustrated, first illustrated cover of book in Ukraine. Uh, not first illustrated book at all, but first illustrated book in ancient Greek uh, poem. Uh, the design of this edition became a model uh, for next books. Where you, 
European editions often used engraving reproduction or images of Homer or Sophocles. Our illustrations resemble Greek pottery in terms or of subject matter and stylistic. Uh, this is edition from Warsaw. Uh, this is this portrait Gomer. And uh, this is uh, Antigona and uh, uh, examples of pottery. Uh, from the uh, page of this book. Uh, from the um, 1940 uh, to the 1950, uh, there were extremely few editions of Rotted literature in Ukraine. The study of Greek classics poems was conducted not in school, but only in the high schools. Then the instruction was exclusively in Russian. Our academy uh, was in Russian uh, in this time. And publication in Ukraine language became unnecessary in this time. Unnecessary yeah. and not popular. Uh, it's a big problem. <laughs> um, but uh, starting from 1950, editions of ancient Greek literature were clearly divided into academic ones, which were not accompanied by illustration, and children edition. Children edition need illustration and all of their need for new, more contemporary translation. Multilanguage translator Barry Stan made this. He translate the works of Homer, Odyssey and Iliada, and he translated works by Ophelius and Aristophanes, and later Shakespeare, Goethe, Schiller, in its cage. Beristan's translations are the best in Ukrainian uh, philology to this day. Return to this book. In 1974, uh, an adaptation of Gomer Iliadi was printed by the Veselka. Veselka was the biggest children publishing house in Soviet Union. Baristan translation was used to create the text and the adaptation itself was carried out by Katerina Glavatska. In this version, his grammar and poetic prophet Gomera was adapted to the simple text for children from seven to 11. Illustration became, uh, you, you can see a cover of this book and first page of this book and uh, page of uh, other page of this book. Illustration become an important component of this book. Uh, they help children grasp the context of another culture and historical period. The illustrator incorporated elements of ancient Greek pottery and Latin fonts for heading and lettering, combining photographic reproduction with their own illustration. Photographic reproduction and own illustration. The choice of similar to pottery is not accidental in the, uh, is not accidental. In the Soviet city, in Kiev, in Kharkiv, mm, or Lviv, uh, especially in smaller towns, children did not have the opportunity to see ancient culture. The best situation was in Odessa. In Odessa was a collection of ancient marble sculpture. Uh, and in Krim, uh, where you can explore ancient monuments of Kersenet. Uh, however, example of ancient pottery and ancient Greek numismatics were available in almost all museum collection in Ukraine, in Soviet period. This collection 
they created some uh, archaeological expedition near the Black Sea in Olvia and Kherson. And a situation, uh, in illustration, a situation between the East and Pottery was strong and valid for children and for old people. <coughs> um, illustration of ancient text changes from the traditional style based on pottery to more free and individual interpretation. In the 60, 70, 80 years, Ukrainian graphics often used red cards, uh, and this was reflected in the few illustrations for Greek tragedy and other uh, ancient novel and uh, Homeric too. But uh, I show you some picture. This year, it, it's uh, seven, 60, 70, and 80 year publication. Uh, but uh, this book. Uh, was a new um, in uh, translated in illust and illustration uh, of uh, ancient, ancient uh, Greek literature in Ukraine. Rostam Musautov uh, in 1980 became an expected and fresh illustration of Gamal. He created the first free illustrative interpretation of Greek scene. Masautov was and is a well-known public artist and has years of experience in various positions in Ukrainian cultural life. His delicate graphics are based on full image from the poem. And now, in this day, this artist uh, work in Kyiv and uh, he is 98 years now and he now work in Kyiv and make uh, next illustration to Gamel. So, uh, some pictures, some illustration to uh, Gamel from Rostam Masaud. The latest collection of uh, works uh, that included illustration is uh, Ovid, published in uh, 2021. The illustrator of this collection is the famous Kyiv graphic, uh, Andriy Chibukin. Uh, Andriy Chibukin was director of Kyiv Academy of Arts until recently. He claims that his illustration were inspired by Picasso illustration of Metamorphose, uh, but he allowed himself to be even more gentle and lyrical in his work. Some picture, this illustration, oh, and Picasso. <laughs> Chibukin and Picasso. It's difficult to say what uh, the next illustrations of ancient Greek literature will be uh, like. But I can say uh, that in this year, in Ukraine, we are publishing two books, Avidi, letters to uh, uh, Avidi Elegi, e, uh, letters to Lucilius by Seneca. It's new edition, new book uh, in this year, published in this year. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers for from this panel also for uh, keeping the track of time
and not exceeding this uh, uh, 15 minutes that were um, scheduled. And uh, according to the program, we should have a break now. But if you're not too tired, uh, we may uh, do a, a, a short discussion now, especially since the first speaker of the next part uh, will unfortunately uh, be unable to, to uh, join us. So um, uh, if, you, if you're fine with it, um, I think we can, we can have a couple of minutes uh, to ask the questions to the uh, presentations of this, of this panel. Um, feel, feel free. to ask uh, Ben Hoffmans uh, about uh, one as aspect of uh, his paper. Uh, I find it very interesting uh, that you um, explain that uh, pictures and uh, videos are the real purpose of these uh, actions or actors. Uh, but I've also read about uh, the hypothesis that maybe they are trying to cover their tracks uh, of looting in big cities. Uh, what do you think about this, or, or how much of a factor uh, this um, could be, or do you, is it main, mainly for show? Uh, and are they, uh, so are the videos the main thing? Thank you for your question. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that it is the main purpose. It, uh, I think it's a. Uh, a quote that I use for from uh, Haramansa, but um, it is one of the purposes, and for sure there there is also a lot of research that show that uh, a part of it has also been to yeah cover some tracks of uh, looting um, and like reselling some of uh, the yeah the smaller objects and antiquities that was uh, kind of. Yeah, yeah, in both in the uh, Mosul Museum and in uh, the Premier Museum, and also um, just uh, from uh, different types of uh, illegal excavations uh, throughout both Iraq uh, and Syria. So it's it's definitely a part of it, um, which I also write about in my dissertation. But I do focus on uh, the images uh, that they have created uh, and on the iconoclasm part of it. Um, but yeah, it is a really, really vast <laughs> subject uh, and a lot of different and complicated and um, motivations that interweave in various ways. So is that does that answer? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see the next question. And we have a, uh, we would like to ask you if you, if would it be possible, thank you, uh, if you, uh, the, to the person who is going to answer the question to come to the, to the center as we're having the uh, online streaming so that the viewers could see you. <laughs> Yeah, I also wanted to say something to Serna, so I thought I'd just follow on from that. Um, but I, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I really like um, what you said about how you are still considering iconoclasm as a as a relevant category. And I think that um, th an illustration of how it's useful to study antiquity and modernity together is that anyone who studied iconoclasm in the ancient world knows that iconoclasm in the ancient world is also very complex and people are also thinking about what images it produces at the end mm -hmm. and people in the ancient world are not idiots who haven't thought about their audience or haven't thought about the complexities of what it means to destroy a, mm -hmm. a powerful image. Um, so the idea that sort of either it's uh, iconoclasm is this superstitious, unintelligent, sort of barbaric practice could only be said by someone who's never studied iconoclasm in antiquity. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think that it's a very useful category, both because uh, 
Well, well, because scholars of iconoclasm have done a lot of work on all the complexities that you're looking at in a modern context. So, yeah, I just thought it's a nice illustration of, of why ancient and modern are, are, uh, should be studied together. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was not a question, so I'll just right. say thank you. <laughs> No, I don't think so. It's just a very nice comment. <laughs> OK. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to ask some question? Uh, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Harrison. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. I think you did a wonderful job. And uh, what I struck about was your methodology, because you used Marshall, and you've said that, uh, well, it's because he focuses on the reader. Uh, but uh, what's, well, how does it look like when you focus on the author? Because I imagine that beyond Marshall, there's also Tony Keen's typology, which is a bit different. But I wonder if you looked at this issue from that perspective. I actually uh, looked at Tony Keene's typology first. Um, Tony's a very good friend of mine. Um, so I, uh, I found Marshall's via Tony's. <laughs> so yes, um, oddly enough, I, I usually uh, talk much more about the author. Most of my papers are full of me saying, um, I know we should think about the death of the author, but actually I'm going to think about the author. Um, so I've sort of done the opposite <laughs> of my, my usual method. Um, but I was very interested in Marshall's approach. I've also, I've been doing some work on Tolkien, and there's a tendency sometimes to get buried in, Tolkien owned this book, but not this book, and he might have known this, but not this. And I found that um, I was disappearing down this rabbit hole of exactly what J.R.R. Tolkien may or may not have read or seen in a museum. Um, and when I came across Marshall's, I thought, that might be a more interesting approach to take with Discworld. I think Pratchett, like Tolkien, was very, very well read. Like Tolkien, he's sadly no longer with us and we cannot ask him. George R. R. Martin was very useful when I wrote an article about um, the influence of I. Claudius on Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon. It turned out George R. R. Martin had tweeted, I. Claudius is the best television show ever, which was brilliant, although I didn't then have much to say in my article other than, yes, <laughs> that is where he got it from. Um, so it was a bit of a change for me, instead of diving down these rabbit holes of what an author did or did not watch or talk about. Um, and I think also because I came to Discworld myself so young, um, I'm now rereading them with a PhD in classics, having originally, as I mentioned, thought Tacitus was called Tacticus. <laughs> I thought Spartacus was called Sporadicus, because that's what they call him in the movie Clueless. Um, so I think for me, with Discworld, it's also really interesting to think about the reader, because my experiences of that series have been so different in terms of the reception of the ancient world from first reading to current reading. So, so yes, um, in, the, in the monograph that we're working on, I talk through both Tony Keene's typology and Marshall's um, typology. I also found uh, Marshall's ever so slightly more useful for Discworld. I feel like Discworld covers pretty much all of Marshall's categories except for direct historical fiction. Um, whereas Tony's are very similar, but they just aren't quite the same, and they didn't quite match what I felt I was seeing in Discworld. Um, but yes, Tony is definitely in the book too. I, I think he would be upset if I left him out. <laughs> thank you. I think you made the right decision. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, since I'm holding the microphone and you're already here, maybe I'll take advantage of asking a question. <laughs> um, I, was, I was wondering about the other books of, of Pratchett, and um, with, with these three examples that you've given us, the amount of the motive, of the ancient motives, is, is very high. And how about the other ones? How many, let, let's say, the other books of Pratchett also use the ancient motives to some, to some extent? This is me picturing the list of the 41 Discworld <laughs> books. <laughs> so there are three 
that come very close to historical, obviously not historical fiction because fantasy. Um, Pyramids, Eric, and the other one is Small Gods, which interact directly with a fantasy version of the ancient world. Um, so that's, uh, oh no, four, I would say The Last Hero, actually. Uh, the Last Hero is an illustrated novel where they go to the home of the gods, um, which is a very tall mountain called Cori Celesti, where the gods live. Um, the name is another joke in English, it's called Dun Manifestin. Uh, English retired people sometimes name their bungalows Dun Roman. It, it, it's a terrible English pun, which I also did not get as a teenager. Um, <laughs> so the last hero, I would say, actually is also more or less in the classical world because it's clearly Olympus. Um, so four of them have very, very strong direct links with the ancient world. But as you can see from the example of Jingo, loads of them have smaller references and the setting for not all, but probably a majority of the books is the city of Ankh-Morpork. Um, and Ankh-Morpork's history, as you probably kind of got a sense of from the Jingo paper, um, their ancient language is called Latation. It's Latin. <laughs> um, there is a murder mystery, which um, I don't want to spoil in case anyone wants to read it, but um, the solution to the murder is to do with the use of puns and Latin and English translations uh, on the heraldry of Ankh-Morpork. So Latin is actually a clue um, to the murder mystery <laughs> in one of the Ankh-Morpork books. So I think you could probably find a hint of something classical in nearly all of them. Um, the ones with less classical references would be probably the witches' books, which are very rooted in English folklore um, and European folklore. Uh, but even them, some of them have lots of classical references too. Um, and then similarly, those intermediary texts. So one of the witches' books is inspired primarily by Hamlet and Macbeth. Another one is inspired primarily by European folk tales combined with uh, Haitian voodoo. Um, those go together <laughs> better than you might think in Pratchett. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's varying levels of classical reception um, scattered throughout the entire series, um, particularly because Roman <laughs> history forms the basis of Ankh-Morporkian history, so just as Greece and Rome are kind of the foundation of European history and culture, so uh, Latation and ancient Ankh-Morpork is the foundation of uh, Ankh-Morporkian um, culture, uh, but yeah. Great. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Thank Ask you. a no, nerd no. about <laughs> statistics. <laughs> it was perfect, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for not giving us too many spoilers. Uh, <laughs> uh, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question before we go uh, for a break? Um, okay, so I think it's the right moment. And um, the time is 40, 45, so we're going to meet at 15, tw 20 past 11. Thank you.
Um, does it work? Yeah, okay, very good. Um, uh, so, uh, let's continue with the second session and uh, our first speaker is Mr. Bartłomiej Żurawski from the National Museum in Warsaw who is going to uh, uh, present a speech entitled The Reception of Antiquity in Pablo Picasso Painting, Boy Leading a Horse, a Metaphor for the Passage of Time. Is it working? Yeah, okay, so. In today's presentation, I would like to introduce you to Pablo Picasso painting Boy Leading a Horse. Mm, this artwork uh, belongs to Picasso Pink Period, also known as his first classical period, which occurred in 1905-1906, shortly after Picasso's return to Paris from Spain. Um, the aim of my paper is to explore the potential sor sources of inspiration for the artist during the creation of this painting and examine whether uh, the incorporation of antiquity in Picasso's canvas can be interpreted as a metaphor for the passage of time. In the foreground of the Picasso painting are shown two figures. On the right is a boy, while on the left stands a, a gray horse. Um, the connection between the two of uh, between the two is established through the uh, boy's gesture, a reaching hand extended towards the animal. Although the precise movement of the hand remains somewhat amb ambiguous implies the act of leading the horse by the reins. These, however, are, uh, these, however, have not been painted by the artist. The intention of this action is further reinforced uh, by the clench of hand uh, of the boy uh, suspended in the mid air of the height of uh, the horse's neck. Uh, the boy's posture reveals an extended leg relative to his overall body, suggesting a sense of movement, motion, uh, and despite uh, the absence of a fully mature male form, the depiction highlights well-defined muscles. Um, Picasso painted some parts of the body in more traditional and realistic manner, while other parts are painted in a generalized and synthetic way. The horse was painted in a more sketch style uh, compared to the boy, but both figures are surrounded by a thick black contour, which uh, is the means of expression that builds up the whole picture. Um, when I was in the New York in early spring of this year, I was struck by the, <coughs> sorry, uh, by the juxtaposition of two paintings from the Museum of Modern Art collection, uh, two paintings displayed side by side. One was a uh, boy leading a horse, while the other was the young ladies of Avignon, a painting that uh, is considered a breakthrough in, uh, in the evolution of contemporary art. Um, let us direct our attention to the boy leading a horse and recognize it as a remarkable example, perhaps uh, one of the last of classical painting in European art. Um, what qualifies is as classical. Firstly, it adheres to established principles of perspective and composition. Secondly, Picasso skillfully incorporates references to earlier art traditions within this masterpiece. Uh, the painting contains numerous allusions to both uh, early modern art and 19th uh, century paintings, highlighting its rich tapestry of artistic citations. Um, a principal, uh, principal interpretation of the painting relates the canvas to Mantegna's Parnassus in the context of unfulfilled love. In the lower register corner of Mantegna's work is painted Hermes with winged horse. 
The composition evokes a strong association with Picasso's work. Ernst Gombrich points out that in the passage from the Odyssey of which Mantegna's painting is based, both Apollo and Hermes would like to be chosen by the goddess of love and take place of Ares. In this context, Picasso's painting can be understood as an expression of unfilled or uh, melancholic love. Um, we cannot think Sir Mar uh, Saint Martin and the beggar. Compared to Picasso's painting, the figure of the beggar and the animal have swept places. Picasso's composition is, in a sense, its mirror image. Um, most similarities can be seen in the way um, the horse is depicted. Um, in creating his canvas, Picasso probably wanted to allude to the work of El Greco, who, although of Greek origin, work and, uh, worked in Spain for the most of his life. And it is also worth remembering that Picasso often refers to El Greco's compositions in his works. It appears that uh, Picasso found profound inspiration in the works of two prominent artists from the uh, 19th century, Paul Cézanne and Paul Gauguin. Both of these painters uh, played a significant role in, the, in shaping Picasso's artistic endeavors. Uh, a striking similarity in composition can be observed between the posture of the boy in Picasso's artwork and the arrangement pot portrayed in Cézanne. Cezanne's painting. Um, the bather, uh, like the boy in Picasso painting, extends one leg in front of him. His left hand rests on his hip at exactly the same angle. Additionally, in both paintings, the figures are skillfully outlined, providing a defining contour that adds depth and form to the overall composition. In addition to inspiration from 19th century and early modern painting, Picasso also incorporated elements from ancient art into his painting. As I said in the beginning, the period between uh, 1905 and 1906 is known as his first classical period, and the influence of ancient art can be observed. An evident manifestation of this influence can be seen in the sculpture-like quality of the boy portrait in Picasso's painting. The figure appears uh, static, resembling a painted statue on canvas. Miles Anger, in his analysis of Picasso's painting, highlights its affinity with the canon of archaic sculpture. Uh, the depiction of the figure's silhouette and the positioning of the le legs evoke uh, similarities to the sculpture from 6th and 5th centuries BC, such as Curios of Agrigento and the Curios of Aristidicus from Attica. Um, the overall expression, expression in Picasso's painting also aligns with characteristics commonly found in archaic sculpture. Um, the walking posture of the figure in the canvas shares similarities with the styles depictions seen in archaic sculpture. Moreover, the nudity mm. sculptures depicting curie were characterized by their lack of distinctive features, appearing rather uh, generic with only few stereotypical physiognomies. Consequently, they serve as universal representations and were used for various purposes during the archaic era, such as cow stages, uh, votis, and memorial grave markers. As Gisela Richter states, the scheme adopted uh, was always the same, a nude youth, generally broad-shouldered and narrow-waisted, standing upright in a frontal pose with one leg, usually the left, advanced. And this description also accurately applies to the figure depicted in Picasso's painting. Mm, in the context of interpreting the painting, it uh, becomes apparent the question whether the strong influence of ancient art allows us uh, to discern its subject matter and significance. Uh, the boy in Picasso's painting is depicted leading the horse with imaginary reins. 
Um, this evokes uh, associations with uh, reliefs from the Parthenon Greece, where horses were led by bronze rain, by bronze reins that have not been survived to the present day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it remains uncertain whether Picasso were aware of uh, the depictions of horse uh, riders from the Panathenaic Frieze in the late 1905 and early 1906, as his visit uh, to London took place much later uh, in 1917. However, it can be reasonably assumed that Picasso was familiar with uh, the sculptures created uh, by Phidias, considering uh, the popularity of Elgin marbles in the early 20th century. Um, Given this artistic uh, inspiration, it is worth noting that in um, the 20th century, the beauty of antiquity can be found in its ruins or incompleteness. This notion uh, alludes uh, to the concept of topos uh, non finito, which appreciates uh, ideas even if the art itself remains unfinished or damaged. And in this context, the absence of reins by which the boy leads the horse can be interpreted as a reference to Pliny's topos. And this perspective of uh, ancient art emerged from Winkelmann's thought at, uh, and it was his description of the Belvedere Torso that in 1753 reintroduced the concept of non finito topos into European culture. Um, the idea that beauty does not require completion uh, suggests that even in an uh, unfinished state, a work of art can be seen as a sign that holds a lot of meaning and can be interpreted in various ways. Picasso is not the sole artist from the late uh, 18th and early 20th century who made references to, Picasso, uh, to Parthenon Frieze. Gauguin's work, including the White Horse, offers an uh, example of painting created in Polynesia that draw a compositional inspiration from depictions of horses and riders in, in the Panathenaic Frieze. William Kane uh, described this phenomenon as a turning point towards classical art, art and culture, where artists consciously acknowledge the, their ancient heritage and utilize it to convey a new and personal meanings or values. And this interpretation can also be applied to Picasso's painting. For Picasso, antiquity serves as a metaphor uh, for the passage of time and the references and the reference to the foundation of European culture, showcasing his erudition and profound artistic awareness. And this uh, ideological connection goes beyond the mere compositional inspiration and painting style, demonstrating a deeper um, contemplation that links Picasso's art with antiquity. Um, within the context of Asian sculpture, uh, the painting Boy Leading a Horse can be interpreted as a metaphor for the passage of time. It seems that Picasso aimed to depict a beauty that has been af affected by the destructive force of time while simultaneously uh, conveying a sense of timeless beauty. The composition of the painting creates an unreal and dreamlike atmosphere. Notably, the figures with, uh, within the painting do not establish eye contact with each other, and the boy's downward uh, gaze contributes to this sense of unreality. We can even call it uh, oneric. Um, additionally, the space in which the figures are shown is hard to define. The manner in which the figures stand or walk evokes a feeling of suspension in both time and space. 
Mm, and this interpretation of the painting is connected to the concept of time and timeless in art, mm, highlighting how a work of art such as a painting can transcend its specific historical context uh, and the evident influence of ancient art in Picasso's canvas corresponds to this concept, providing additional depth to the exploration of time and timeless with this uh, masterpiece. Um, Picasso in his painting incorpor incorporates references to various aspects of ancient art. He draws uh, upon the canon of archaic sculpture, incorporating its influence uh, into his work. Additionally, uh, the figure of the horse and the motif of absent rain establish a connection to, freeze, um, to the Parthenon frieze, and this synthesis of archaic and classical art is evident in Picasso's work. Um, moreover, he alludes to the Asian concept of topos non finito, which was reintroduced and popularized in the 18th century by Winkelmann. Uh, furthermore, uh, the reminiscence of ruins deeply rooted in uh, European culture provides further uh, insight into the interpretation of painting. It uh, evokes a sense of melancholy associated with passage of time. By incorporating these elements, Picasso's painting become uh, a metaphor for the fleeting nature of time and beauty. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It's uh, interesting to think that uh, even for the very modern artists, it was very hard to escape from the influence of the ancient art. And now I would like to um, introduce Mrs. Roxana Maria Wajkosz, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Wrocław, who is going to present as a speech entitled How to Wear Peplos in Modern Times, the case study of Dios and Dolce and Gabbana's reception of Greek and Roman clothing in fashion shows. What is the contemporary ancient look and how to wear a peplos in a modern times? Dear researchers, these thought-provoking questions are related to the reflection of the fashion shows of Dior and Dolce and Gabbana, because between 2019 and 2022, these fashion houses used antiquity as, the, as a theme in their fashion shows, creating designs inspired by the culture of ancient Greece and Rome. However, the way these two brands re referred to that era represents their distinct approach and interpretation of the Greco-Roman cultural heritage. This includes the aesthetics employed in their designs, the garment's form, and the motifs that serve as a contemporary transformation and reinterpretation of ancient archetypes. Therefore, the questions arise. What does Dior and Dolce and Gabbana's reception of antiquity look like? What motives do they reference in their designs? How do they reconstruct ancient fashion and incorporate it in, into a new context, creating a unique stylistic iconography? I will address those issues in my presentation, analyzing selected examples of designs showcased in fashion shows. This presentation is a narrative about the reception of antiquity in, in aesthetics, culture, and its contemporary interpretation in the context of fashion design. You may wonder why, when discussing fashion, architecture is presented before Colossi. It is a Doric temple from the 5th century BC, located in the valley of the temples in Agrigento, in Sicily. This temple served as a backdrop for Dolce & Gabbana's women's collection fashion show, Alta Moda 2019, held in Sicily. The ancient structure was not just a setting for the event. It was an integral part of the show, as the models walked out from into onto the runway. The temple itself provides an intriguing space for the show, 
acting as a portal that allows the revival of ancient figures and their integration into the contemporary narrative of Greco-Roman goddesses and rulers. Among the showcased garments, two dominant types can be distinguished, those directly reflect, referencing ancient silhouettes and the transformation of ancient motifs into costumes. On one hand, there are references to the iconography of the goddesses, such as Diana, Psyche, or even a syncretic combination of Athena and Hermes. In this case, the Dolce designs perfectly incorporate the iconography characteristic of each figure, featuring, featuring short kittens of Diana's hunter's bow, Psyche's butterfly wings and a bow, alluding to her association with Eros as well as Athena's helmets and her long robe. The designs also draw an inspiration from the shapes of ancient garments and their manner of wearing, reminiscent of a Roman matros on, or legionary, stands out as symbols of victory in ancient, uh, ancient times. Additionally, the designers incorporate textiles, application and prints with ancient motifs, including columns, palmens, and figures found in vase paintings. Furthermore, Dolce also presents intriguing fabric designs, almost duplicating the characteristic composition of Greek vases. One could say that they subjected these objects to visual reinterpretation and dressed their models in them. For example, a creation resembling an ionic column refers not only to an architectural element, but also alludes to Dior's iconic dress, the Palladium dress from the 19th. In the context of the show, attention should be also paid to the color palette of the garments, specifically gold and white. Analyzing this aspect, one gets the impression that the women's silhouettes resembles sculpture crafted in chryselephantine techniques or marble. They, these not only colors in this show, black also appears, giving the antiquity inspired creation a modern, modern, uh, a more modern evening glamour effect. A strong saturated colors are also make an appearance balanced by pastel hues in slightly whimsical and rococo designs. In the same year, the house also released a twin collection of men's fashion. Alta Sartoria 2019 took place at uh, the Palazzo in uh, Schiazia in Sicily. Uh, in its courtyard, a scenography was created with monumental figures of Atlas, such as Hercules Farnese and Adiscobolus, emphasizing the narrative with symbols of male power, strength and beauty, not in an Olympic temple, but on earth. The inspiration of antiquity in men's fashion is an attempt to portray the immortal hero Victor. Furthermore, the runway layout resembles a Roman amphitheater. The way antiquity is referenced in this creation is similar to the approach taken in women's design. There are also two types of costumes, those that directly refer to ancient silhouettes and a contemporary look that utilize ancient motifs. On one hand, there are references to figures like senators uh, or glad gladi gladiators. And on the other hand, there are gods such as Poseidon Zeus, in a short tonic, holding shield and lightning in his hands, or Hermes Ares with a shield and a caduceus. However, contemporary silhouettes are clearly dominant in this show, resulting from the transformation of ancient costumes. This includes men wearing pants and shirts resembling modern-day ancient philosophers or orators. Gods also make appearance, such as very modern version of Apollo, still recognizable by his attribute, the liar. The collection is characterized by the gold and red colors, symbolizing um, power, while white and beige are also prominent, giving the designers a serene yet elegant look. In contrast to Alta Moda, where models were dressed in costumes in this show, the focus is more on the transformation from ancient ar archetypes to the contemporary version, one could say from the tunic to a suit. This visual narrative also changes the perception of individual silhouettes, 
from an immortal hero ruler to a figure of an elegant deity. The variety of forms and motifs used by designers creates a unique iconography inspired by Greco-Roman culture. It is presented as a story of a powerful goddess and, and gods, the newborn versions and the rebirth of antiquity in the designs of Dolce and Gabbana. While the house's ancient world is full of gods and deities, heroes and rulers, reminiscent of classical types associated with ancient culture, Dior takes a different approach in its reception of antiquity. Dior departs from the dressing up in ancient costumes, which is characteristic of Dolce & Gabbana. What Dior shows, primarily in an antique look, in its modern version. This is intriguingly demonstrated in the spring-summer 2020 Haute Couture collection show from the first presented silhouette, a narrative based on a showcasing creations that are already a transformation of ancient costumes and their characteristic shapes becomes apparent. Even the first two silhouettes are reinterpretation of the peplos flowing the movement of the model on the one side and transformed into a women's suit on the other. The main motif in this show are the four ancient clothing forms and the way they are worn and draped. Selected aspects are combined with contemporary, more geometric solution, creating an elegant, subtle, and yet very simple appearance. The dominant colors of gold, white, and beige evoke a similar impressions as in the Alta Moda 2019 show, that is, the vibrancy of ancient sculptures made of chrysalifantine or marble. However, what sets this show apart, showed apart from the others is the contrast between the draping of five fabrics. On one hand, they emphasize the construction of the garments and the proper draping of the fabric, reminiscent of the way garments were depicted in classical period sculptures. On the other hand, the light flowing fabric with numerous layers resemble Hellenistic figure in Kitons. In this show, there is another significant element, the juxtaposition of antique inspired costumes and the modernized version, almost like an interpretation of the ancient archetypes and its contemporary reinterpretation. Dear researchers, Dior Cruz 2022 is a show where the fashion houses returns the theme of antiquity and continues the solution it showcased in the spring-summer 2020. Furthermore, the show refers to the history of the fashion house, specifically a photo shoot from 1951 that took, that took place on the Athenian Acropolis. Dior returns to the capital of Greece and in the promotional film references to this iconic photo at present its creation at the Panathenaic Stadium. Um, dear researchers, models are dressed in the variation of peplos and keton, and they showcase the garments while walking on the track. Similar to the spring-summer 2020 collection, the main motif is the interpretation of the ancient archetypes and the subsequent presentation of its contemporary reinterpretation, repetition of contrast between references to the construction of garments in classical and Hellenistic period sculpture are also noticeable. However, the main narrative axis here is the integration of antique-like uh, costumes into a sporty and casual look, which is emphasized by the model sport shoes, long socks and large bags. It is interesting that in the antique elements of the creation, white and beige dominance, uh, giving them a Greek sculpture-like character. On the other hand, they are combined with the elements such as a black corset armor and look, uh, creating the look of a modern gladiator. In their designs, uh, Dior engages an, in an interesting dialogue with what we can describe as at the classical beauty of antiquity or classical ancient silhouettes and their uh, design presents a different reception of ancient fashion than the previous discussed show. It is not exclusively ancient haute couture, ancient costumes, or even ancient glamour. These silhouettes designed by Dior can be described as 
casual Greek goddess style, which serves an inspiration and homage to Greek garments and the eternal allure of antiquity. The, inter the uh, interpretation of ancient fashion, its literal version, and then the presentation of the transformation of a given motif by incorporating modern wardrobe elements. The vision of antiquity created by, by Dior refers to the classical beauty of Greek sculptures. Inspiration from form, draping, silhouette, and its modernized appearance is the story of antiquity according to Dior. Dear researchers, let us ask again what the contemporary ancient look is and how to wear petals in modern times. The examples of fashion shows presented provided an answer to this question from the aesthetic perspective of the Dior and Dolce & Gabbana fashion houses. The unique iconography they created is a narrative of the reception of antiquity expressed through the transformation of ancient archetype such as clothing, art, and culture. In this regard, the Greco-Roman heritage has been presented in fashion and the vision of its designers, who portray the models as new ancient deities reborn in a contemporary look. On one hand, in the form of strongly antique-inspired costumes, and on the other hand, in the contemporary form, the shows by Dior and Dolce Gabbana are not reconstruction of ancient attire, nor do they aim to depict historical truth. Therefore, they should not be analyzed in the terms of correct versus incorrect. Contrary to appearances, the designers in these shows tackle a highly problematic issue, which is antiquity itself. How different eras shaped its image and how current audiences perceive it. This is evident in the analysis of the dominant color palette, gold, white, and beige, as well as the presence or absence of ornaments. In my opinion, both Dior and Dolce and & Gabbana embrace this challenge. In their designs, they engage in a dialogue with antiquity, showcasing the perception of this heritage, its interpretation, and its contemporary reinterpretation in fashion. Dear researchers, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for showing us how antiquity can still be attractive today and not just a part of a noble but obsolete and dead past. And now I would like to uh, invite Mr. Andrzej Szotek from the Museum of the University of Warsaw and the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology of the University of Warsaw with the presentation entitled The Reception of Ancient Architecture in Computer Games, Pros and Cons of the Assassin's Creed series. Thank you very much. Um, Where is the presentation? So, welcome everybody, and uh, some of you may ask why we are talking about computer games. Um, let's start with, uh, there is something like uh, people have desire to interact with history, and uh, also it appears through games. Um, so, because of that, we have, I mean, a lot of uh, computer games uh, connected to history events, uh, I don't want to uh, speak about something like history games. It's like uh, games connected to history events. And I will tell you uh, in a minute why is that. Uh, so, 
we have, uh, for example, uh, Total War series, uh, Crusader Kings, Empire RF, uh, the other uh, strategies like uh, Stronghold and Age of Empires, uh, which actually paved the way uh, for other games. Uh, we have something a little bit uh, more modern like Saboteur, so S Second World War in France. Um, and it is only uh, top of the iceberg. Um, so uh, why should we uh, talk about computer games? And uh, the answer is quite simple and short, statistics. Um, during the uh, project of uh, National Library, uh, they do research every year about uh, how many books uh, people read uh, during the, I mean, per year. And uh, in 2022, uh, most of the, uh, um, from the participants, something like 33% uh, uh, said that uh, they read at least one book per year, and it's not a very glorious achievement. Um, and only 7% uh, from the participants said uh, that they read seven or more books per year. Uh, on the other side, we have global statistics uh, connected to video games uh, and also the other parts of modern world, so man picture. Um, so uh, at this moment, uh, we have something like circa 8 billion humans on our planet. Uh, about 3.7 uh, billion are video gamers. Uh, video gamers because, uh, so first of all, uh, we have unlimited possibilities in the digital environment. We can uh, add everything, the only border uh, is our imagination uh, and maybe knowledge um, in that fact. Also uh, the technology aspects, uh, so object scanning, uh, we can scan almost every object from the um, archaeological finds, uh, like ceramic, for example, uh, through the uh, whole buildings. Uh, then, after scanning, we can create uh, the 3D models. Uh, and when we talk about models, uh, you, I think you remember the um, 2019 when uh, there was a fire that destroyed Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. And uh, Ubisoft Entertainment, so the uh, producer of uh, video games, uh, they donate uh, half a million euros uh, for the reconstruction. And also they offered uh, the 3D models uh, that they made earlier uh, to one of the games. Uh, actually, it was uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, that is um, history about uh, French Revolution. Uh, and those are the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, plot is not history. Uh, and that's why I'm uh, talking about games connected to history events, not uh, history games, because uh, what uh, what we have here is based on events, uh, but it is not um, like uh, it's not uh, what uh, the producers uh, have in mind to offer the uh, consumer. It's it's like. Uh, you can have romance, you can have uh, battlefields. Uh, the plot is uh, more important than true. Uh, and also, of course, other objectives, uh, because games are not the, um, they are not tools for learning, uh, objectively. Uh, those are tools for, for entertainment. Uh, and because of that, uh, it's not like we will play a game to read about what happened, really. Uh, we play a game to jump, ride a horse, uh, fight with somebody, etc., etc. Uh, now, the uh, main 
hero of our story here. Uh, so the Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, uh, the hero that we can see in the middle uh, is Ezio Auditore uh, de Firenze uh, and uh, the main story of that game uh, pla uh, take place uh, during the Italian wars, so it's like uh, beginning of uh, 16th century. Um, and of course it is fictional story based on true events. Uh, there is a conflict between two formations, Templars and Assassins, uh, so our main hero is uh, the Assassin. Um, and of course, uh, during this whole series of Assassin's Creed, uh, the, uh, those two formations, uh, those two groups, uh, in some way control the historical events, we can say, from the other side of the curtain. Um, so let's let's speak a bit about architecture. Um, as we can see here, uh, we have Colosseum. Uh, that's why I took the Brotherhood part from the Assassin's Creed series because uh, we have uh, best uh, presentation of uh, Rome architecture. And um, what? what you see uh, on those pictures, um, we have quite a nice model, uh, but it's not uh, quite accurate, unfortunately. Uh, the scale is wrong, the real uh, Colosseum is much bigger. Um, I hope that it's not like uh, I'm smaller than uh, the main hero of the game. Um, and also, uh, I hope you can see that um, there are also no holes, characteristic holes in the walls uh, that uh, were made during the centuries after the removal of iron clamps. Um, the other example is Pantheon. So, uh, again, uh, the scale is a little bit wrong, model is quite good. Um, the nice aspect of uh, Assassin's, Creed, uh, Assassin's Creed series is that uh, when, we, uh, when we visit some characteristic places, uh, we have something like uh, historical templates and uh, we can uh, search uh, after that uh, more information about uh, specific buildings. Uh, so it's, let's say, a little bit like a scholar element in the games. Mm, also, uh, what you can see here uh, is the inside of the Pantheon and uh, what Assassin's Creed series uh, also is about, it's about climbing. It's uh, so you can get inside the, uh, the buildings. You can uh, you can climb on the roofs, everything like that. Um, and the best uh, exemption we have here. So the other uh, the other uh, part of the architecture of Rome, so the Ark of the uh, of Constantine, and. Um, Again, uh, quite nice model. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, this game is quite old because uh, its premiere was in 2011. Uh, so uh, a lot of changed, um, but, uh, meaning the technology way. Uh, but uh, as we can see here uh, on those uh, two screenshots on the left side, um, we can see that uh, the inscription, uh, it looks very nice, uh, but on the other way, we have other carvings uh, that, uh, the and they, they are flat, uh, which is uh, not good. Uh, I think uh, the problem here was actually the uh, technological problems like uh, space requirements, uh, because uh, when we are talking about uh, Assassin's Creed games, the um, uh, 
Brotherhood uh, part uh, was like uh, eight, nine gigabytes. And uh, now uh, when, we are uh, when we can play the other uh, parts uh, of the series like Odyssey or uh, Origin, uh, which we'll see in a minute, uh, it's like 120 gigabytes. Um, so that's about the architecture here. And uh, the, this proposal of the um, historical events and uh, how a producer of games is um, trying to connect uh, with history. So uh, we have uh, Cesare Borgia. Uh, he is the main villain of uh, that part of the series. Uh, Cesare was uh, the son of the Pope Alexander VI, uh, and he died in March uh, 1507 um, during the Battle of Vienna. Uh, according, to according to history, he was uh, killed by soldiers of uh, Second Count, uh, Count of Lorraine. Uh, Louis de uh, Beaumont, uh, and uh, the body of Cesare was left naked on the battlefield. So uh, what we have in the game, you have uh, the uh, portrait of the, the Cesare on the left, uh, how we can uh, uh, meet him in the game, uh, and actually it is the main goal to uh, kill him in the end, uh, and also to rip off parts of his uh, wonderful, marvelous uh, armor. Um, and then we can kill him, this is the end of the story. Uh, so it is a little bit connected to history. Uh, we are not soldiers of uh, Count of Lorraine, but something like that. Uh, now we go to uh, year 2017. And we have uh, another part of uh, of the of the Assassin's Creed series. So uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, it is story um, in the uh, Ptolemaic Egypt. And uh, what we can see here is the lighthouse of Alexandria. Uh, actually, this is a fictional image because we don't know how it really looked like. Um, it collapsed uh, after the earthquake uh, in the Middle Ages, and after that, uh, parts were uh, used uh, like, like in the recycling way uh, for the, mm, for the, for the uh, repurposed, uh, for the citadel of, uh, of the Epcot Bay. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this building uh, occupies the same site, uh, so we can't uh, reach the even the foundations of, of the lighthouse. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there was a technological jump, uh, and uh, the models are uh, much, much better. Uh, also, the production from uh, 2018. Uh, I unfortunately, I haven't played that one, uh, so uh, I only added uh, as the example of the uh, graphic uh, uh, in, the, in the game. Uh, so we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, as we can see, it takes part in the Greece. Uh, here we have the main temple of the Athenian Acropolis, uh, so the Parthenon. Um, and uh, so another we have another jump in graphical possibilities. Um, and going to the conclusions, uh, what we can say about world of video games, uh, we have the potential. Uh, we can make models, we can make reconstructions, even simulations. Uh, we can use it in science, uh, and I think we should, um, but actually uh, there, is, uh, there is something that we should remember, uh, and we should take this subject very carefully, uh, because it is very easy to uh, make 
his interpretation and in the final effect um, got not history actually but fiction thank you very much Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Definitely the potential is um, absolutely immense. Um, uh, and so are the uh, possible difficulties. And now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Grzegorz uh, first from the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow, who is going to present the a uh, speech entitled Between Archaeology and Art, Antiquity in a Book, Press and Movie Illustration, Sources, Inspiration and Visages. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, the presence of antiquity in the art of later times <coughs> is visible and noticeable, especially in the large forms. Uh, architecture, painting, sculpture, all its influence on the theory of art. The analyses covered in particular those epochs that were influenced by the aesthetic forms or ideas of ancient times, the Renaissance or the Enlightenment with classicism at, at the forefront. The 19th century and even the second half of the 18th century brought significant progress here, caused by ecological discoveries, both of the Greco-Roman and Hellenistic cultures, as well as the work of the ancient uh, Orient. At the, same, uh, at the same time, technological progress, the spread of printing, illustrated press and book and album publications resulted in a significant expansions of the media with which it was possible to show the antiquity to the broad audience. The world of the ancient then descended into wider circles of the recipients and thus began to be present also in small forms such as press or book illustrations. The breakdown uh, in the new stylistic of antiquity based on its archaeological cognition, which lasted since the 19th century, reached its apogee in the 20th century when the birth in painting, sculpture and architecture the re realistic evocation of antiquity visible in academic painting gave way to its creative processing visible in symbolism and antiquity appears in not only on illustration but also on screen and accompanying media. It is impossible to present this complex process in the course of, uh, of an hour by citing numerous examples from European or even Polish art and culture. It is worth using a few examples closest to us to indicate turning points in the presence of ancient aesthetics in small art forms inspired by a plot set in, anti in antiquity. Let's use two great ancient Polish novels as the axis of the approach, Kowadis by Henisienkiewicz and Pharaoh by Bolesław Prus, both illustrated in the press and books and later filmed. Created in the, in the last decade of the 19th century, two great Polish ancient novels set in different epochs refer to different ideological content. Interestingly, they were created almost simultaneously and originally appeared in press without illustration. The first book edition of Kowadis was published in 1996, followed a year later by Pharaoh. Sienkiewicz's novel quickly gained illustrators in the persons of two painters, Jan Styka and Piotr Stachiewicz. The figure of Piotr Stachiewicz is somewhat forgotten today. A student of the Krakow and Munich academies, Focus on religious and portrait painting. In the context of, its, of his ancient inspirations, the journey he made to Italy and the Holy Land was probably important. He had friendly relations with Sienkiewicz and for this reason, he naturally undertook the task of illustrating the writer's, the writer's latest novel. The sack of 20 paintings created using uh, then the Anglizar technique was created in 91 and decorated uh, the edition of the novel from 92 to 9010. The cycle was, uh, has been divided into two groups, the first of which includes scenes with, among others, Petrinius representing the pagan world, 
The second includes the scenes with Ligia, Helon, and Ursus, or certain Petra, it's the Christian world. This juxtaposition of two words present in the content of the novel will, as it turns out, often be the main key to the painting interpretation of Kvovadis. The illustrations by Stachiewicz belong to the type of illustration that refer almost literally to selected scenes from the novel. Their juxtaposition, however, does not create the most important points of the novel. In other words, we will not build the plot only on the basis of, li of illustrated scenes. We may be dealing with an attempt to show the philosophical la lawyer of the novel and antiquity, hence the procedure of quoting texts serving as titles of paintings. As far as the style of Stachiewicz's works is concerned, critics immediately after the publications of the work pointed the, out the painter's academic skills visibly in the pictures, but also the capture of the types of heroes, including the reference to the Sklavitsness. Sienkiewicz's relationship with Jan Styka was much more problematic. Styka was undoubtedly a great admirer of Sienkiewicz's works, including Kovadis, which, which corresponded with the ancient interest of the painter. The author of the paintings inspired by antiquity, such as Meeting in Viapia, and the lost monumental panorama, the martyrdom of Christian in Nero Circus, made together with Zygmunt Rozwadowski and Fabio Fabi. Stika created 100 woodcuts and six to reproductions on copper. Published in the year 91-94, the illustrations became extremely popular and were often reproduced and published as postcards. The style of Stika's works has been is assessed differently. It uh, undoubtedly draws from the academic approach to the subject, using vivid colors and dynamic shots of the characters. These tools were used by Stika to show elemental advertises, but also to emphasize the mysticism of the new religion emerging from the ashes of paganism. Stika also used Roman architecture and ecological findings as components of his works. Undoubtedly, Stika's painting by Sienkiewicz, or more broadly, his style of depicting the rural scenes, captured the imagination of numerous artists, illustrators, and filmmakers with a painterly approach. Also, the numerous mentioned works by other Kovadi illustrators did not differ much from the idea, the idea, style, and composition of Stika. Italian illustrator and sculptor Domenico Mastroianni made a series of illustrations published in 1913 in the form of postcards. Perhaps they are, uh, they are a response to the expectations of then Italian society and are a kind of glosses or even statements of readers. These pictures are known especially from sculptural style of presenting the heroes inspired by the ancient, not only Roman, but also Greek and Hellenistic sculptures. At the same time, the second great Polish ancient work in the field of illustrations was less fortunate. The first edition of Pharaoh were published without illustration. Jan Kolewiński, less known illustrator, took up the task of illustrating the work while Proust was still alive. His artistic education was limited to Wojciech Gerson's drawing class. From 1990, he constantly collaborated with Illustrated Weekly, publish, publishing numerous illustrations, mostly genre and, il and literature illustrations. As the main illustrator of Illustrated Weekly, Kalewinski naturally undertook the task of preparing illustrations for Pharaoh, but probably due to time, he did not have time to prepare them for the first press editions of the novel. Although the first book edition with his pictures was published in, 94, in 1924, however, illustrations to particular scenes of Pharaoh appeared sporadically in Illustrated Weekly. Edition of the novel from 1924 contains 10 pictures, usually titled fragments of text with a reflective sound. The pictures are traditional in their stylistic form and quite simple in composition and reception. They refer to traditional narrative il illustrations, including classic and well-known biblical illustration by Gustav Dorr. However, there are no ancient Egyptian attributes in them. The selection of the illustrated scenes is also remarkable. The artists choose those that can be attractive due to dynamism of the described scene, the participation of people, objects, or an important moment, but also those with less aesthetic but greater mystical potential. 
showing the supernatural through it was probably a conceptual challenge for an artist embedded in the realistic or historical tradition. The Gebesner and Wolf publishing house did not immediately think of, Hol of Holowinski as an illustrator pharaoh. After Proust's death in 1912, to celebrate the writer's death, the publishing house decided to issue a bound, richly illustrated edition of the novel. The task of making the illustration was entrusted to Edward Okun, a well-known painter at the time, but above all an illustrator associated with then fashionable symbolism, modernism, and Art Nouveau. At the time, Okun was associated with the young Polan milieu as an illustrator of literature and the leading magazine Chimera. We don't know what were circumstances of entrusting the task of illustrating a historical novel to, the, to this artist so that Faro artistry could be shown to a wider audience, including those maturing artistically in modernism. The task was treated seriously and even scientifically because the publishing house founded Okun stay in Egypt, where he went at the, at the end of 1930s. The effect of the visit were oil paintings and lost watercolors inspired by Egyptian art and culture. But the most important effect of the stay was a series of 21 illustrations to Pharaoh. However, the resulting illustrations did not appear in print as planned. Unfortunately, we don't know, we don't know the sources indicating the reasons for abandoning this publication. Illustrations by Okun appeared only in the edition of Pharaoh 10 years ago. In terms of composition, Okun's illustrations imitate paintings known from papyri, stills, and decorations of Egyptian graves. As Okun was in Egypt and had the opportunity to see original monuments with preserved figural or decorative scenes, the influence of specific paintings or scenes from papyri, sarcophagi, and tombs is visible in these paintings. However, this is not a copy, but a creative processing of a given motif in the spirit of Art Deco. What's more, it seems that the artist juggled individual scenes and Egyptian motifs, but combined them intelligently without violating the rules of Egyptian composition. As, as we know, the composition on the cover was later used by Okun for election propaganda printing, where instead of Pharaoh, there is a portrait of Józef Piłsudski surrounded by eagle wings. It seems that Okun choose, chose themes as well as the forms based on Egyptian sources which he saw in situ, and not only on the content, but thus can constitute independent images understand understandable by the recipients. Often there is a little action in them. They are more static and symbolic, as well as close in terms of composition, symbolism, and decoration. It also testifies to a certain degree of Okun's penetration into the spirit of Egyptian art, not only at the level of form, but also of ideas. Egyptian art perfectly harmonized with symbolism, operating at the time with legible forms, constant in time and space. Okun's works are therefore one of the most interesting manifestations of the reception of strongly symbolic Egyptian art in contemporary art. As already mentioned, and, uh, as in the case of Kvovadis, late illustration of the pharaoh, both in the Polish version and, the f and in foreign editions, did not differ from tradition and do not represent any significant artistic value. Il and unillustrated editions predominate, and if there are pictures, they are direct references to well-known scenes from the repertoire of Egyptian or Roman iconography. However, it is worth mentioning it's worth to mention the illustrations and postcards made by Jan Martin Schanzer, known mainly from his children's illustrations. Issues with his illustration appeared several times from 1968, and postcards were in circulation in 1969. His recognizable characteristic style, full of dynamics, abbreviations, and twists, seems to have re revived from frozen Egyptian characters to Pharaoh. Schanzer processes. Uh, Proceeds the available Egyptian scenes in his own style, and in the case of colored cards, he brought them to life with colors. Also interesting is the rapid interest in life illustrations inspired by antiquity, which was the national cinema, which, in the regard, adopted new inspirations from paintings or even postcards. This issue is a separate research topic, but in the context of illustration of antiquity, it is worth to mention at least the first films 
which adequately refer to the style of illustrations that were in circulation at the time. This is especially important in silent film where the lack of voice enhances the meaning of the image. Quo Vadis was filmed very quickly, as already in 91, a three-minute etude inspired by the novel was produced in France. The next two great silent productions were made in Italy. In 1913, Enrico Guazzoni directed the film lasting over an hour and 40 minutes, shot in atelier, filled not only with canvases imita imitating Roman backgrounds, but also with three-dimensional three decorations. Many scenes are a direct transfer of postcards, illustrations of the novel, which is most visible in the scenes when Eunice kisses the statue of Petronius. The success of the popula and popularity of the film means that more than a decade later, in 1924, Gabriello Danuzzi and Georg Jacobi directed another film adaptation of the work. Unlike its uh, predecessor, the one and half hour film was not a success and even turned out to be commercial fellow. As of here, we can talk about enlivening the illustrations, although the scenes are more dynamic and some of them were shot outdoors. From the silent film period, it is also worth mentioning the film adaptation of the Bible, The Ten Commandments, directed by Cécile de Mille from 1923. This film, shot on, <coughs> on the grain scale, scale, was one of the best examples of how the contemporary world imagined antiquity, in this case, uh, biblical. An Egyptian temple complex and a number of, of other sets were built for the film in the desert of California. The paradox of archaeology is that 100 of which lie in California sands. The 50s brought a significant break the 15s and the first Soviet of 60s. These movies like Povadis, Ben-Hur, Spartacus, Cleopatra, or remake of Ten Commandments are most often referred to, uh, to as films of peplum gen, it is sword and sandal films. Peplum films are characterized by the advantage of visual attractiveness over source-based knowledge about events, facts and realities which are intertwined with legends and myths. The lack of reconstructions also applies to the aesthetic lawyer, including props or location. These films were mainly shot in studios and film atelier. Critics often notice here a connection between the peplum cinema and the academic painting of the 19th century in the subject of antiquity. However, cinema was more eclectic than academic pictures, so it can be considered one of the many sources of aesthetic and compositional inspiration. Composition seems to be the key link between academic canvases and Hollywood movie frames. Another in the history of the European film adaptation of Kovadis from uh, 2001, directed by Jerzy Kowalarowicz, is a product of completely different era. The, a different concept because the expectations of the recipients are the in the beginning of the 21st century were different, and the production and technical possibilities that the authors of the film took advantage of were different. But the film's work was also different, both the subject and the time, times to which the film takes us. Nero's Rome is a city of element, a mixture of splendor and poverty, and above all, colorful and vibrant seat. Just like in the canvases of the great academies, Jean Lange Rome or Almatadema. Jerzy Kowalerowicz is also the author of the completely different adaptations of the ancient film, far off from uh, 1965. The, the director, together with the team, prepared an outstanding film, which, as we know, was even nominated for an Oscar. Critics mainly emphasized the ideological method of the pharaoh, looking for political threats, but in our context, it is worth considering the film's artistic and aesthetic qualities. Pharaoh, like other ambitious productions of this type, grew from, the root, from two roots, literature and archaeology, and more broadly, fascination with history and ancient culture. Of course, the film was read, as already mentioned, contemporary. This way, the intention of the director to define one of the themes of the film as showing the eternal struggle for power in the history of mankind. Nevertheless, attention to detail, realism, combined with the mysticism of ancient civilizations means that in aesthetic category, this film is multi-threaded. What's more, the use of plural, fragile stage design without splendor and exaltations which was also matched by the performance of the actors, 
made the Egyptian antiquity paradoxically appeal to us even more real and true in the aesthetic Gloria. Because it, if not, it, it is not possible to completely recreate the ancient reality, it is worth minimizing it, and this procedure worked perfectly here. The play of sunlight, whether in the desert or in rooms, enclosed in raw stone, evokes as... Sorry? Okay, just uh, last slide. Evokes associations with the paintings of orientalists from, from for whom light was one of the themes of the, the Eastern worlds. The lack of splendor also applies to numerous ancient Egyptian props visible both in the background and those displayed close to the camera. It is worth mentioning that, that not just anyone cares about the perfect compatibility of the groups with the preserved Egyptian artifacts because the father of the Polish medical archaeology, Professor Kazimierz Michałowski, who was the main concern of the field. Diverse. Undoubtedly, the choice of the plot is important here, and illustrations of film adaptation of a myth or a story is one aspect, but a literary theme where antiquity is preceded twice, literary and visually, is another aspect. In any case, however, we can see here a conglomeration of both archaeological inspirations and, which is very interesting, the influence of the academic art of the 19th century, where, as we know, ancient topics were at the top of the hierarchy of, of themes. Not always the historical archaeological tree is important, as we can see in the case of Pepsina films, where more important is an idea and visual colorful attractiveness aimed at broad circles of recipients. Regardless of this, the book and press illustration and then film frames shaped and in a way still shape today our imagination about the past, but still a large world of antiquity. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, sorry. Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. Uh, yeah, and, uh, the, the subject is so huge that it's hard to explore it fully and unfortunately the time is going on and uh, we have to move to the uh, discussion now. Um, so, who would like to begin? And I will also ask um, uh, the person that will be answering the question to go forward to the center. Uh, yes, I have a question for Andrzej. Uh, I re really like your presentation. And uh, I have a, questions, uh, a question about the potential of using the games like Assassin as with the whole series uh, in education, in as a, a tool for the teachers and um, to, uh, to have the argument for, for, for that, I was playing the Assassin's Creed Odyssey uh, and my boyfriend was watching as I was playing and there were plenty, plenty of moments where we were discussing about the architecture, about the, how uh, the creators um, showed the life of the ancient people. And uh, this was the discussion like sh could be placed in the classroom. So I would like to ask about the develop this educational uh, aspect of using the games and maybe uh, something that you, um, that you point at any disadvantages. Thank so um, the answer is uh, it already is uh, in the classrooms, but uh, I didn't um, get any information about uh, some uh, school programs in Poland, uh, in England and uh, United States. Uh, it is actually quite a modern solution to uh, educate uh, young people, children uh, to some aspects of history with the computer games and also Assassin's Creed in, in that. It's uh, quite different from the ex education I remember from my school yeah, yeah, it It's is. really <laughs> nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> you uh, I would also like to ask you, Andre, if I may. Thank you. Um, I also really enjoyed your uh, paper, and uh, I too would also like to. Uh, ask about the potentials, but more generally. 
because uh, you also pointed out the disadvantages uh, of these games. Um, I don't think you mean uh, exact historic games, but uh, I would like to argue that it should be possible uh, for um, such games to be entertaining and also educational at the same time. Uh, I tell you why I think this, because it's not the same thing, but uh, with my colleagues, we worked on a living history program, which was an immersive uh, crime mystery um, program. And we absolutely approached this uh, by um, researching the, the historic and archaeological background and, and using all kinds of uh, details of um, the social environment and um, objects and the characters that uh, can populate uh, that certain point in history, but we did not use characters who uh, live uh, in history. Or maybe they can talk about the kings or historic events that really actually happened, but we also add fantasy to the mix. I think uh, this approach might or should work at the same time, so maybe do you know any uh, good examples of this uh, in video games? Um. I mean, I totally agree that uh, it should be we, we should use that. And um, good example. Hmm. Uh, there is a problem actually uh, with that because uh, I, I searched uh, for the uh, quite good game in the level of uh, education, and um, actually I have experience with uh, one in particular. It's called uh, Treasure Hunter Simulator. And uh, at the first uh, point of view, uh, it was amazing. Uh, it's a lot of locations. Uh, it uh, shows you how to use uh, these scanning devices. Um, and uh, also I saw that one of these sites is Palmyra, uh, also Tadmor uh, in Syria. And uh, when I saw that, uh, I decided I have to buy it and I have to play it. Um, and uh, at first point, it was really awesome because in one moment you are in Syria, uh, in the middle of desert, uh, you have ruins, mm, and after the moment you realize that uh, what you had, uh, uh, actually what what I had uh, during uh, during these studies uh, on the. Uh, Bachelor studies in archaeology, uh, that the plans are not correct, and uh, the best point of uh, that game was when I uh, in Palmyra, uh, I digged up uh, the soldier button from Pittsburgh. So, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I think. Uh, Do you think this is a? memory issue or a budget issue um, uh, most often, so? I think time. Time, time is the issue because uh, now uh, more and more games uh, are coming out and uh, the producers, uh, they don't want to uh, make solid products uh, that will, in our case, educate people. Uh, it, it has to entertain them and uh, the best way is if they will play one part uh, for, for example, a year, and they will buy another part, etc. Understandable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about uh, the loss of color from Dior and Dolce e Gabbana? We look around, we see gold, white, but this is not antiquity. Yes, um, and in my opinion, I was also um, thinking about the using colors uh, by those houses for a really long time, and the, there are two answers for your question. The first one is the aesthetic of the whole house, because the, uh, the gold uh, is uh, something really significant. Uh, the gold, the white, and their connection with the black is the significant for Dolce & Gabbana, the whole houses. We, 
we, we can also see for a different, uh, different fashion shows from the Alta Moda uh, series, like uh, they released a fashion show uh, which is inspired by Byzantine art. So we have gold, we have black, we have uh, models who are walking with, was walking with a really beautiful crowns, which is also characterized uh, for these houses. Uh, and um, for Dior, uh, I would not say the why that the gold is significant for, for, this, uh, for this house. Uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the connection, the, um, uh, making the analysis of the Dolce Gabbana and the Dior together showed that not only the aesthetic of the house, but also the, um, something that we can uh, say as um, the beauty of the antique, as white antique. But uh, it's, it's something like maybe they were also inspired by the uh, Greek sculptures, the uh, Greek uh, sculptures made not on the marble, not on the original, but on the copies that they may have seen in the museum, in, in the books. Uh, I think that also it is important to see how the houses uh, speak about their collection. For them, it's not the historical truth, it's not the reconstruction, uh, it's something like the vibe of the antique. So I think that they go in that way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question also to uh, Roxana and Andrzej. Uh, good call, Andrzej. Uh, because uh, so some of us, uh, the researchers, are working uh, on the uh, topic of uh, reception of antique in the 18th century, Middle Ages, 16th, uh, 16th centuries, but you have the opportunity to work with the uh, modern times. So I have a question. Uh, did you try to contact with the authors, designers uh, of uh, Dior, of uh, Assassin's Creed, Ubisoft? Um, uh, did you try to uh, have a conversation with the uh, creators of, uh, of the things that you are w w working on? I will start. I not contact uh, the designers, but I think that that contact or uh, try to have the contact will be significant uh, to the next level to develop the topic like the writing article because um, what I was searching for is not only just the collection itself but also the uh, interview they gave for the Vogue, for the runway, for the Harper's Bazaar, those uh, popular uh, fashion uh, magazines and that's uh, what they said, it was also uh, a point of view that I was um, comparing with, with my opinion. So actually, I also haven't contacted the Ubisoft producer, uh, but that's also because uh, they have a lot of fan pages and they do a lot of articles connected to their uh, creative part of production, so it's just the work to know that, you know. Um. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the future, of course. I'm sorry, but we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, but no worries, nobody's escaping and they will have opportunity to uh, continue the conversation during the lunch break um, or maybe it's a very short one we have three minutes okay but you have to promise it's a short one uh, so I wanted to ask um, uh, perhaps do you have details on how uh, the uh, cooperation between uh, people who are actually educated on how uh, you know the architecture 
uh, archaeology, uh, ar archaeological sites, uh, how they look like, how the cooperation between those specialists and game creators, how that works. Because uh, I'm wondering who's uh, responsible for um, making th those designs. Uh, is there, like, who, who in the end is uh, the person that makes the things we see in the game look the way they do? Uh, because perhaps there, there isn't enough cooperation between uh, the specialists and the gamers. You did mention that, uh, well, uh, usually there isn't enough of time to uh, work on the game, so it's, uh, mm, well, uh, perhaps detailed enough, uh, the, the project in the game, or, uh, like, is, the, is that the only reason you think uh, that the projects aren't as good as they could be, uh, the, the, the designs, or um, perhaps another reason is that the, the cooperation is... Uh, somewhat lacking, that's my question. Mm, so uh, normally it's like that, uh, that studio uh, doesn't have uh, the uh, specialist in, uh, in, in the crew. Uh, they uh, do some uh, consultations with the specialists and uh, it's like uh, you have uh, an agreement, for example, uh, 10 buildings and uh, they do uh, some uh, scientific memo for each of them uh, and uh, it is uh, the base to create another uh, models for example and put it inside the game but uh, from the mm, studio's point uh, of way and uh, the crew uh, actually they have no idea what it was actually in the past, how it was. So. Thank you. Uh, I had an impression that you used this three minutes to ask the question. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you very much once again, and as I said, we will have the opportunity to continue the conversations now during the break. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much, all the presenters of this panel. It was a real pleasure to listen to you, and we've had an opportunity, amazing opportunity to go through very, very different aspects from literature through the video games, the fashion industry, and the illustrations, the paintings. It was really Amazing, and now I would like to invite all of you for the um, lunch break, which is uh, going to take place uh, there, right? <laughs> no, there, okay. <laughs> so thank you, and we will see each other as, yeah, follow, follow Emilia. <laughs>
our next session. Uh, the chair of this session will be Dr. Yulia Burdajewicz, who is an art conservator from the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. And Yulia, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second panel today, uh, which will be focused on plaster casts. Uh, we have here with us today four distinguished speakers who will present various aspects of these uh, really fascinating subjects from cast collections through um, provenance and authorship re research and technical analysis. Uh, as previously, the discussion will take place after all the, uh, the papers have been presented, so write down your questions for later, <laughs> and I would like to ask the speakers to respect the time frames for their papers. And without further ado, I would like to invite and introduce the keynote speaker of this um, panel, Ms. Astrid Nielsen from the Stadt Lisekunstsammlungen Dresden with a paper from Manx to Rietschau and Rodin, the plaster cast collection in Dresden. The floor is yours. My speech will take 30 minutes and a half, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> dear Madam Sir, dear colleagues and guests, dear listeners, I'm delighted to have been invited to this conference and I'm very honored to speak here today. Echoes of Antiquity is a title which opens a nearly uncountable number of doors and behind each we are able to reveal hidden stories. The lovable mountain nymph Echo herself told as many stories as Godfather Zeus had amorous adventures. Her fate has it that she could only repeat what has been said before. It has been the great challenge for artists in all centuries after ancient antiquity to create something new, and not only repeating what was already there, on the basis of Polyclete, Phidias, and others. The inspiration by the figures of the myths and of the ancient world of gods gave long-lasting impetus to the art of the 18th and 19th centuries, as well as to the avant-garde of the 20th century. In my paper, I will first concentrate on the history of the cast collection of Anton Raphael Mengs and on its presentation after the arrival of the cast in Dresden. Then I will explain the new arrangement until the end of the 19th century, a point in time when it was not a pure Mengs plaster cast museum anymore. With the opening of the Dresden Albertinum in 1891, a new era began under the director Georg Troy, who acquired and collected plaster casts just like his predecessors, but also for completely different reasons. A brief look on the expansion of the collection and his efforts to include contemporary art will follow, and I will explain with two examples where and why ancient art was always a source of inspiration for sculptors, and why the Dresden cast collection made this possible. During the 18th century, the collection of casts assembled by Anton Raphael Mengs was virtually unrevealed of its, in its importance. Thus, when 1779, the news arrived that the artist had died in Rome and his collection was being put, put up for sale, the authorities in Dresden did not hesitate for one moment to secure the remaining pieces. Known as the new Raphael, and the most successful painter of his time, Mengs had amassed the casts over successive decades with feverish enthusiasm, sparing neither cost nor effort. Taken from prominent sculptures of antiquity, we see them here as well, the Renaissance and High Baroque, the casts presented a rich fund of historical illustrative material, not only for Mengs himself. He also placed them at the disposal of a rising generation of artists as objects for study. A close friend of Johann Joachim Winkelmann, whose treatise, Gedanken über die Nachahmung der griechischen Werke in der Malerei und Bildhauerkunst, Thoughts on the Imitation of Greek Works in Painting and Sculpture, published in 1755, had laid the theor theoretical groundwork, as we all know. 
Mengs had become the founder of neoclassicism in painting. For more than a century, classical antiquity was to serve as the yardstick and basis of artistic production. How Mengs presented his casts in his studio is unknown. We do have a description, however, that the English artist James Northcote sent to his brother after he had visited the collection in autumn of 1778. He said, he, Mengs, keeps two grand houses in Rome. In one of them, he has a gallery with the finest collection of casts from the antique that I ever have seen, where anybody has full liberty to draw at all hours who is only just introduced to him. This description shows that Mengs had remained true to the pedagogical principles he established. As long as they could present a letter of recommendation, everybody had full access to his antiquities and could draw and study them. In 1761, Mengs went to Madrid and took over the position of the first chalk painter. His main task was the ceiling frescoes in the Madrid Royal Palace, except for the throne room and antesala, for which Tiepolo was in charge. In addition, Mengs was involved with the real Academia de Bellas Artes de San Fernando and initiated a collection of casts as well in his Madrid studio. All the while, he kept his Roman studio and household. When Mengs decided to return to Rome in 1776, he offered the, the casts as a gift to the Spanish Academy. The Italian collection, however, was offered for sale after his death. After the court of Saxony had acquired the remaining 833 casts in Rome in 1782, the collection was put on display in Dresden four years later. Initially, in the former painting gallery of Count Heinrich von Brühl on the Brühl Terrace, the collection was made accessible to the public for the first time on 19 April 1786. From 1794 onwards, the cast was shown on the ground floor of the so-called Stallhof building, stable yard building, today the Johanneum, in close proximity to the famous picture gallery, which was located on the upper floor since 1747. Displayed in public alongside masterpieces of painting, the collection of casts became a major attraction in pa Dresden from the end of the 18th century onwards. In his Meine Freunde in Sachsen, My Delights in Saxony, published in 1801, the Greifswald poet Gotthard Kosegarten reported, Hence, this collection is the most sublime, the most consummate, and the only one in the whole wide world. Moreover, what is most agreeable with all, seldom does an antique work come down to us wholly without flaws, but here nothing is a fragment or in pieces. Here one has Olympus with its beauties, unblemished and without confine. And even before, in 1794, the German sculptor Johann Gottfried Schadow recorded to his travel journey, in his travel journey, it was his chief goal to visit the Mengstrus Museum in Dresden. He counted it, it a particular pleasure to see Meng's fine plaster casts, believing that doubtless nothing like this is to be found in all Germany, as he wrote. The enthusiasm of this description attests to this special esteem according to the collection, which at that time enjoyed almost greater attention than the Dresden collection of antiquities itself. Subsequent purchases resulted in the collection's steady increase. As early as 1838, for example, 50 metopes, 22 pediment fragments, and 68 frieze panels from the Parthenon had been acquired to the cast collection through the negotiation of Karl August Böttiger and Be August von Lindenau. With the opening of the famous gallery building designed by Gottfried Semper at the Zwinger in 1857, the collection of casts was given a columned hall of its own on the ground floor. The allocation of space 
the display, the cast and the paintings was based on the sta stable yard building ideas. Plaster casts on the ground floor, the treasures of paintings on the first floor. Hermann Hettner, director of the collection from 1855 until 1882, arranged the collection in a chronological order. The Parthenon casts had been presented in a separate space, Greek, Roman, and other casts in the individual areas between the columns. The casts of the Mengs collection were integrated. With great commitment, Hetna was able to push through numerous acquisitions in a targeted and successful manner to close gaps in the inventory and to be able to document the latest archaeological excavation results. Soon, in December 1876, casts from Olympia arrived in Dresden only a few weeks after their discovery. Hetna was also able to extend the collection of casts to include works from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and casts based on contemporary works, especially works by Dresden sculptors such as Ernst Julius Henel and Ernst Ritschel. In the southern aisles of the large main hall of the new gallery building, Hetna had set foot up the casts of medieval and modern works. In the back of the hall, you can see Michelangelo's Pieta. In the foreground on the left is the statue of, Ra by Raphael, of Raphael by Anton Raphael, uh, by Ernst Julius Henel, and on the right, Mercury by Bertel Thorvaldsen. The consequence of the acquisitions that was the was that the rooms in the gallery building allocated to the collection of casts were so densely populated that further expansion of the collection, especially at a time when numerous archaeological discoveries were, were being made, was hardly conceivable. Let alone one could accommodate the contemporary works. The task here was to find a suitable solution for the future. Well, this is another example of the 19th century casts. This solution was found in 1882. Hesner passed away and Georg Treu was appointed the new director of the collection of antiquities and plaster casts. It was a decisive pass in the history of the Dresden Museums because these two collections in particular were about to undergo important changes. In 1882, the antiquity collection was on display at the Japanese palace, the former porcelain castle of August the Strong. Here, too, the rooms were needed for other purposes, and it became clear that a new location was needed for the antiquity collection and the associated collection of Renaissance bronzes and Baroque art. As a result, of these spatial requirements, the Saxon State Parliament made the decision in 1884 to transfer the collection of antiquities and plaster casts, which were jointly referred to as the Skulpturensammlung, sculpture collection, from 1887 onwards to the former arsenal of the city of Dresden. The arsenal had been constructed between 1559 out with a spacious inner courtyard. The facade was later decorated in a discreet Baroque style as part of the first renovations and expansions that were executed in the 18th century. When a new arsenal was built in 1877, the old building lost its original purpose, and by 1889, it had been converted into a museum for the sculpture collection and the main state archive, which was then housed on the ground floor. The building was given the neo-Renaissance appearance we see today and was named Albertinum after Albert, the reign ki reigning king of Saxony. When the building was completed, the casts had to move once again in 1889 and were united conceptually and orga in organization with a collection of ancient originals. Between 1871 and 1896, the photographer Hermann Krone extensively documented the holdings of today's sculpture collection. With his photographs of the Elbe sandstone mountains in Saxony, Krone was a pioneer of landscape photography. 
the pictures he took for the then separate museums of antiquity and cast and the regional museum are, alongside the landscape photographs, the largest body of work and also the most lucrative commission the photographer ever received. Shortly after the opening of the cast collection in the Albertinum in 1891, Kroner also began to work here. The result is an album with over 100 photographs in cabinet format. Thanks to his photographers, photographs and of others, we know a lot about the details of the presentation. The original works were exhibited on the first floor in the two opposite halls, open to the public in 1894. When visitors came into the museum through the main entrance on Bruhl's Terrace, they encountered the bust of the Saxon rulers in the lobby. Turning to the right, they made their way into the Hall of the Herculaneum Women with its magnificent decorations and ornamental ceiling paintings. The hall of the on the opposite side offered further antique originals. The casts were shown in the skylight halls on the second floor since 1891 as well as in a glass construction in the courtyard. The total of 2,400 casts on this floor were provided with detailed inscriptions and didactic illustrative material, so that a catalog was not necessarily needed to understand what one saw. Georg Troll was convinced that, as he said, only in this way does a collection of casts become alive and understandable. Only in this way does the library of the collection from which the illustrations to be attached can be taken become not a treasure accessible only by a few, but a common heritage. Although the presentation of cast followed a strict chronological order, they were arranged in such a way that visitors were first greeted by the heyday of Greek art casts after works by Polyclet in the foyer. Then, followed by art from ancient Egypt, Assyria, up to the hall dedicated to the Parthenon sculptures and the Olympia discoveries. After passing through the halls, main halls, and adjoining side rooms, which were reserved for the casts of ancient sculptures, one entered the rooms with casts of sculptures and reliefs from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. The elaborate and magnificent design of the halls harmonized with white casts on display. Georg Troy explained, when decorating the larger cast rooms, the idea was to distinguish the collection of casts as a selection of the most excellent work of sculptural art of all times, even externally with rich artistic decoration. With the exception of the state archives that were located on the ground floor until 1915, the Albertinum was a museum that was entirely devoted to sculpture and, as a result of the innovative exhibition and collecting activities of its founding director, Georg Troy, it achieved national and international recognition in the years around the turn of the century. In the Albertinum, the casts were intended to be part of an encyclopedic exhibition illustrating the historical development of sculpture, which would not have been possible using the original works in the collection. The so-called Rietl Museum, which had been presented in the Palais in the Great Garden in Dresden since 1869 and attached to the sculpture collection in 1889, was also installed here, actually in the mentioned glass construction in the courtyard. These casts were not reproductions, but original plaster casts, sketches, and casting models. You see the, the model of the famous Goethe and Schiller monument in Weimar on the right. Ernst Rietel's style was very varied. He produced works imbued with much religious feeling. Other important works were purely classical in style. He was specially famed for his portrait figures of eminent men treated with much idealism and dramatic vigor. Trained in Dresden, in Berlin, and Italy, his late neoclassicism was obviously influenced by Greek and Roman art, yet turned into a 19th century naturalism or realism. However, 
echoes of antiquity are always visible in his work. Presenting the regional casts in the Albertinum demonstrate the concept that Georg Troy was pursuing. The second spectacular change in priorities initiated by Troy was his expansion to the museum's collecting activity to works of contemporary art. The Troy era began in 1894 when the first purchase of works by the French sculptor Auguste Rodin for any German museum were made. Why is this interesting in this context, one might ask. In fact, it is important on the one hand for the reception of ancient art and on the other of Troy's understanding of the material plaster. The influence of Auguste Rodin on the figural sculpture of the whole century was comparable to that of Michelangelo to the art of high renaissance and Rodin himself adored the art of Michelangelo. Up to the age of 30, the French sculptor was able to achieve only little success with his new kind of art. But in 1880, the state commission he received for the gates of hell intended as the portal for the planned Paris Museum of Applied Arts and thematically inspired by Dante's Divine Comedy was the turning point that led to his worldwide acclaim. Many of Rodin's figures grew out of this large-scale project, project with its many figures, which he continued to work on right up to his death, probably the Cariatide as well. In addition, he created numerous single figures, portraits, drawings, and monuments. His figures are the groundbreaking works of modernism in sculpture, introducing the fragment, the torso, and the non finito at the end of the 19th century, and leading the processual and the incomplete to aesthetic independence. Rodin himself always declared, antiquity is my youth. There are some 6,000 works under the general title of Rodin's Antiques in his own collection. He rejoiced in collecting human and animal figure fragments, Egyptian, Greek, or Roman, headless bodies and disembodied heads, hands, feet, arms, and legs, which dismembered became irrelevant to the measurement of ideal proportions. Rodin drew energy and inspiration from the art of classical antiquity, and he absorbed and assimilated the models of ancient Greek and modern art in his own work in innovative ways. He admired the sculptures of ancient Greece, and in particular that of the Parthenon by Phidias, with a lifelong passion rarely surpassed by any other artist in his time. The British Museum exhibition in 2018, Rodin and the Art of Ancient Greece, was not only a landmark in the history of the British Museum because the Parthenon sculptures were shown for the first time together with the work of a modern master. Time and time again, Rodin, in his writing and his art, returned to an abiding conviction that ancient Greek sculpture, whether fragment or whole, was not merely a passive survival of the past, but could be an active force for the present. Rodin said, an art that has life does not reproduce the past, it continues it. Exhibiting and selling plasters as valid works met with a lack of understanding on the part of his contemporaries. Art historian Fritz Wichert expressed deep skepticism about Rodin's works in 1908 in relation to an exhibition at the Frankfurt Kunstverein. He wrote, the shades may perhaps bring joy to a few old friends, whether they will find new friends for the artist here is highly questionable. They repel rather than inspire. He also gave reasons why the plaster casts as representatives of the Rodin style in its most radical nuance were not able to succeed. He continued, some people say, ah, plaster is not a proper material, while others say they are casts of living people. A third group finds them indecent, a fourth anatomically impossible, the fifth cannot accept the absent limbs, while the sixth say he's a charlatan, and the seventh he's crazy. 
Also Wichert was convinced of the artist's artistic quality of Rodin's work, his statement clearly shows that many people reacted with incomprehension to the use of plaster as a material because previously, in 19th century academic sculpture, it had been used exclusively as a preparatory medium for creating a design or model. In the oeuvre of Auguste Rodin, however, plaster came to be more highly appreciated because the artist used it to develop an innovative manner of working which enabled him to create both assemblages and fragmentations. Hence, his status as a pioneer of modern sculpture is due not only to his development of the torso as an independent work, his interest in the unfinished object along with the associated open meanings and ambiguity in the expression of emotions and subjectivity. Rodin also played a groundbreaking role through his appreci appreciation of the aesthetic effects of plaster, which was fundamentally different from supposedly more noble materials such as bronze and marble. In a letter to Georg Troy, Rodin wrote that he would prefer to be presented in the museum by several works in plaster rather than by a single marble sculpture. In view to the Dresden cast collection, Georg Treuer would have been acutely aware of plaster not only as a material for reproductions or models, and therefore he successfully promoted the purchase of numerous plaster sculptures. Nevertheless, even controversial debates did not cause Georg Treu to waver in his purchasing policy. Dresden still has Germany's largest collection of works by Rodin, assembled during the sculptor's lifetime and is outstanding, in particular on account of the number of un unique works in plaster, including a large-scale version of the thinker. And this would certainly not been, have been possible without the cast collection and its origins going back to Mengs. The further fate of the cast collection, Mengs and beyond, can quickly be recounted. Although the Dresden Sculpture Collection had around 5,000 casts, interest in them decreased after the First World War. Many collections of casts throughout Europe suffered a similar fate. The sculpture collection was closed when the Second World War broke out and the casts were stored in the basement of the Albertinum. The only works left on the upper floor were the large size plaster casts, including the Laokoon group or the Fanis bull, as well as casts from other epochs and the molds from the Dresden Replica workshop, and these were destroyed when the group burned. The cast collection, War Losses, were kept within reasonable limits, but its golden age seemed to have passed once and for all. The exhibition of approximately one 300 casts established in 1951 as a replacement for the original ancient work that had been taken to the Soviet Union merely served as a stopgap. The rest, still several thousand objects, lived a shadowy existence in the basement of the Albertinum. But even plaster cast collections can experience a renaissance, however. A research project organized by archaeologist Moritz Fiederlehn led to a database with 4,700 objects and the presentation of the collection as a show depot in the re renovated cellar of the Albertinum in 2000. This storage was open to the public until the river Elbe flood of August 2002. Large-scale casts had been placed on pallets during the re research project so they remained in the basement. Smaller ones moved to the ground and upper floors into the exhibition rooms. Today, most of the plaster casts are stored in the rooms of the former Kunstgewerbe Museum. A few can be seen in the cellar of the Albertinum as a smaller show depot once again. With the reopening of the new Albertinum after the flood and the remarkable restructuring of the building in 2010, a selection of modern casts from the 19th century is now integrated in the exhibition halls, from Rigel to Rodin. A representative selection of the historical Mengs collection 
can be today be admired on the ground floor of the so-called German pavilion in the Dresden Zwinger, next to the Semperbau, home of the famous Old Masters Picture Gallery, comparable to their first presentation in Dresden in the 18th century. Furthermore, the exhibition will highlight the mutual influences of painting and sculpture, as well as underlining the importance of antique sculpture for Renaissance and Baroque painting. After seven years of partial closure, the famous museum building from 1855 now shines in new splendor since the, its reopening in February 2020. The world famous angels of the Sixtine Madonna have been shining in the race night sky every evening since the reopening of the renovated Old Masters Picture Gallery until July. The work of art based on Raphael's famous picture comes from the Austrian artist Peter Baldinger. Then is now is the name of his installation, which creates a powerful symbol of the link between the paintings and sculptures and of the museum's importance as the home of world famous art, works of art, such as the Sixtine Madonna. Over and beyond, it gives expression to the important fact that the art and the objects of the past have a vivid living presence. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for this very interesting paper and a uh, great introduction to this uh, panel and its subject. And now I would like to invite the Dr. Magdalena Getaldic from the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts, Gliptotech, uh, with the paper plaster casts of Croatian sculptural and architectural heritage in the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts, Gliptotech. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. So, uh, as announced, my uh, theme is uh, Plaster Cast of Croatian Sculpture uh, and Architectural Heritage in Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts, Gliptotech, where I work as a curator of Plaster Cast collection. As it was founded uh, as a Gipsotech of city of Zagreb in 1937, the first and the only museum in Croatia that is, yes, sorry, that is specialized in collecting of plaster casts and it is based on the principles and spirit of European phenomenon of cast collection. It preserves and exhibits the largest collection of sculptures in Croatia, uh, original works of Croatian sculpture and, as a pla and plaster models of 19th or 21st century, plaster casts of antique sculptures from European museums and from Roman province Dalmatia and Pannonia and of course, cast of national heritage from pre-Romanesque to Renaissance period. The founder, Anton Bauer, emphasized the first goals and the mission of Gipsotech in 37, and that is collecting and presentation of Croatian sculptural heritage through plaster casts of the most significant historical and artistic monuments, as well as collecting relevant works of Croatian sculptures from 19th century to present days, uh, especially plaster models. In 19th century, the most important plaster casts of Greek and Roman sculpture were sim systematically collected from museums in London, Berlin, pa Paris, Munich, Vienna, Rome, by uh, at that time Ministry of Culture, Dr. Isidor Kršnjabi, with the aim of establishing Gibbs Museum. But over the time, there was no supervision over the collection, it was dispersed and in various institutions it was largely devastated and lost. So preserved casts uh, were in at the Archaeological Institute of the Faculty of Philosopher of Philosophy where Bauer was curator, actually demonstrator of the plaster cast collection of ancient sculpture. In his study trips, uh, Bauer got acquainted uh, with numerous collection of casts in addition to ancient ones he became familiar with the meaning of national castes, especially medieval and Renaissance in France and Germany. And in his notes, he says that the most beautiful and significant museum is the Parisian Le Musée de Monuments Français. 
So the intellectual movement that emerged from Romanticism at the beginning of the 19th century encouraged the acceptance not only of classical antiquity, but also of other national artistic styles, which were previously considered barbaric. Each country had its own cast of sculptures and ornaments that were considered to be of national importance. They came from national monuments, but also from excavation campaigns at archaeological sites in Europe and beyond, for example, Egypt, uh, India, and we can see here a Mexico plaster exhibition in London. There are more and more public art museums that have become standard of all major sites throughout Europe and United States in 19th century. And most often, these are national museums created with the aim of building national identity and culture. And their main purpose was systematic study and systematization, all with the aim of fulfilling the ideology of dream of a perfect collection that would, fulfill it, that would fully confirm the cultural legitimacy of a certain nation with its integrity of material, material presentation. Here are examples of Musée de Sculpture Comparé Trocadero at the Vidou Gallery and uh, Musée des Monuments Français. Also, this Museum of French Monuments is one of the leading and oldest museums dedicated uh, to architecture and monumental heritage, as it was firstly created in 1882 as the Museum of Comparat Comparative Sculpture before becoming the Museum of French Monuments in 1937. In this context, casts are important as the only and possible way to realize the idea of this ideal uh, collection in the museum. The concept was devised by Eugène Villette-Ledic, who uh, proposed the creation of the museum who would gather plaster casts of the most important medieval monuments of French sculpture and architecture. In his thesis, the evolution of sculpture are illustrated in the presentation of set of plaster casts. And of course, the plaster workshop was established in the cellars of Trocadero, greatly contributed to the expansion of the collection. And the museum had almost 7,000 casts taken from uh, French monuments. This museum differs from other European museums because of its architectural dimension that makes the Museum of Comparative Sculpture unique at the time of its foundation. Why am I telling all this? Because uh, Anton Bauer uh, was following his example in designing such a museum for Zagreb in Croatia. Musée de Sculpture Comparé was a role model for, uh, for him in 1937 and in establishing the museum as well as collecting the antique and national casts of the sculptural heritage. He collected casts of historical monuments, especially those found in numerous museum collections throughout Croatia and in situ location, which are parts of architecture and are public plastic. This collection of casts was the backbone of the establishment of the Gipsotec, and special, uh, or the specificity of which is the unique possibility of a systematic, uh, a systematic presentation uh, and development of Croatian sculpture since the foundation of our state. And Gipsotec is the first institution specialized in plaster casts and sculpture, and of course, ar architecture. On the French model in the cellars of Trocadero, Gipsotec founded its own workshop, uh, thanks to which a large part of the cast of national sculpture was created. The workshop uh, used traditional method for casting, which was replaced after with modern methods using silicon molds, and of course later 3D uh, models. This traditional method, which has been used since ancient times, is still practiced today in our workshop, as well as some other European uh, workshops. In its application, first, a clay mold is made, uh, a clay mold is made that is the negative of the sculpture that is to be copied. A protective agent is applied to the shape of the original and then the plaster in thin layers, which when hardened forms a solid plaster mold, which is made in several pieces together called piece mold, all in plaster. Before casting the positive, a reinforcement is placed, usually metal armature, which serves to strengthen the structure of the cast. The voids are then carefully pulled into the tightly joined mold, and the mold is rotated to prevent forming air bubbles. After the plaster has set, the parts of the mold from the piece mold 
are removed and the plaster cast is left to dry. In the places where the individual parts of the mold came together, lines appear that are mechanically removed in the final and fine processing. The quality of the cast depends on the less visible joints. And the plaster piece mold are highly quality and they can be reused many times. Some have been in use uh, for over 70 years in our workshop. After uh, this example of casting in modern silicon method by Bubina doors of the Ipsotech workshop, which is unique wooden 13th century doors in Split Cathedral. And as I said, today we use uh, in some uh, our casts uh, uh, 3D modern technologies. This, this is a printed version. Following the concept of the Museum of Villette Le Duc and Bichan, who contributed to the appreciation of the outflows of national medieval architecture and sculpture, Bauer collects his collection in Zagreb in very difficult conditions of the Second World War, but with the vision of his French role models. He founded Ipsotech in 37 at the same time when the Musée Monument Français moved to Palais Chalot. The collection of cast uh, national sculpture in Croatia through the 19th century was not systematic and sculptures were cast sporadically for individual exhibitions or for other purposes. We can see here the cast that has been made for Millennium Exhibition in Budapest in 1896, Adriatic Exhibition in Vienna in 1913, for example, International Hunting Exhibition in Berlin in 1937 and 38 in New York. So this period of pre-Romanesque and Romanesque Croatian sculpture was systematically collected, which refers to the localities important for Croatian history since its establishment. Biaci, Biskupia, Knin, Solin, ancient Salona, and so on. In 1940, there was a larger casting project organized in Trogir of Radovan portal on Trogir uh, Cathedral that was started, but due to the circumstances of a Second World War, it was not completely uh, cast. The work continued uh, two years later in Zagreb with the support of Yugoslav Academy of uh, Sciences and Arts. On that occasion, several more monuments from Trogir, uh, Dubrovnik, Split, uh, Shibenik cathedrals were made. Since 1947, Gipsotech has been cooperating with the Yugoslav Academy of Sciences and Arts for the purpose of preparing and organizing a big exhibition of medieval art of the people of Yugoslavia, which was held in uh, Palais Chalot in 1950 in Paris. A year later, it was staged in uh, Zagreb in Art Pavilion. This large exhibition was supposed to present the world public uh, and artistic wealth of the medieval period of the from the territory of Yugoslavia, and it, at that time it was a significant cultural event. In addition to Gipsotech employees, a whole series of collaborators and plasterers from various parts of Yugoslavia at that time were engaged for the purposes of exhibition for the exhibition. Cultural and historical monuments were intensively cast in situ and mold casting technique was applied. This significantly expanded the Gipsotech collection because after this exhibition, it entered the museum holdings. Then many monumental parts of architecture were cast, uh, which are today our part of our collection. Portals from Studenica, Dechani, Little Brothers in Dubrovnik, Donat in Zadar, Cathedral in Split. And 30 statues, these monumental medieval gravestones, which are on UNESCO list heritage, were cast. During the work of Parisian exhibition, there was a growing connection with Yugoslav Academy of Sciences and Arts, and Gipsotech became a part of it in 1950, and it changed its name to Liptotech. The collection of plaster casts of historical monuments had its first permanent exhibition in 1954, then in 65, and so on, till present days. And independently of the exhibition in Paris, the fund was uh, continued to be expanded from all around Croatia. Casts of cultural and historical monuments were made in Zagreb, Cathedral in Split, Cathedral in Zadar, Šibenik, as I mentioned, uh, Dubrovnik and Split. The collection is also significantly filled with casts for the, some, new of some new exhibitions and medieval sculpture. 
I would like to show the role of the cast or in its significance for international heritage and the aspects, uh, the preservation of the original form for restoration and conservation work, monuments and parts that were removed from the in situ locations that were destroyed or their historical artistic qualities were significantly damaged due to the exposure, exposure of the environmental elements for example, destroyed statues, as I uh, showed you, portals, parts of architecture, inscriptions, and to preserve their the, the preservation of their plaster casts and molds uh, is of great importance in order to preserve the historical and artistic qualities. For example, this restoration of Radovan's portal from Cathedral in Trogir wouldn't be possible uh, without preserved plaster casts that is kept in our museum. Of course, the role of the uh, cast of sculpture of St. John the Baptist in Baptistry of Cathedral in Trogir wouldn't be possible to reconstruct without our plaster cast. The role of cast and preservation of its original form are seen in some other important uh, sculptures uh, in Croatia. And of course, uh, there are threats, uh, environmental, but also uh, for example, the uh, world war, uh, the war that happened uh, in our home land uh, in 1992, and some of the, um, uh, for example, in Dubrovnik, some of our casts served to restore some parts of the cloister of the Franciscan monastery. The casts also, this is a plaster cast and the original, and the plaster cast has a role in s uh, scientific and research work with in preservation of their historical layers of individual monuments. For example, for its iconography analysis, it helped for researchers uh, to uh, restore this iconography of this uh, very important monumental statue in Bosnia. For example, lost or destroyed uh, parts of architecture and sculpture are preserved in our collection in plaster. Natural disasters, earthquake that we experienced in, in 2020 are just few more reasons to preserve our national heritage in plaster. Gliptotech has a unique collection of casts and molds of national heritage from antiquity till Renaissance period. And after this earthquake, we are facing a new era of rethinking and reevaluating our heritage with plans for a new display that is planning after renovation of our museum complex. So the history of the collection of the National Croatian Heritage is a reflection of the spirit of the time in which it was created. And that is the time when heritage confirms the national continuity of Croatian history. Through the making of molds and plaster casts in of individual monuments, the original appearance is preserved, which was destroyed due to various circumstances or were damaged due to various reasons. And through castings, their historical dimension is preserved. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Wolfgang Schwann who will present a paper uh, entitled Who Did It? Research on Munich Plaster Casts Dormatory. The floor is yours. I'm an old man. Um, where is it? I'm very proud to be here again. 
I go through the whole world and I have a look on a lot of plaster cast. I, I heard, uh, I didn't uh, disclose city, uh, city science uh, in, in maybe in 2015 and uh, it goes from America to Greece, from Somi to, uh, to Spain. And what I'm doing, I'm looking for these small signs, the manufacturer marks. And over the time, I find a lot of them. These are only 25 of more than 200, only in, in the uh, archeo archeo classical archeology, span uh, not in the medicine, in uh, animal uh, 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 collections. I found a lot of them. Uh, I have a data sheet and all the items I found, the form, the dimension and so on, goes into a, a database. So every mark has a database with all these, uh, these dimensions. But we don't want to talk about these things. We want to find uh, out who is, who made this plaster cast. Uh, on the slide you see uh, the growth of moles at the gips in, in, in Berlin. And uh, every year you found more uh, moles. Uh, this is our, these are the origin for the plaster cast where you put the gips into, inside. And if you take a look in the address book, in Munich maybe, you found a same curve. Uh, approximately 30 people around 1900. Who did it? Let's take a look from abroad. Um, some of, of you know the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And uh, when they when they plan to, to present um, classical sculptures in New York, they, w they couldn't uh, buy originals. They could only buy plaster cast because uh, there are in other collections the originals. And they made a paper where to buy, where can we have all these pretty things, these plaster cars, to show it to our people in America. And from Munich, we have, we found the names, the Academy of uh, Arts, Mr. Geiler, Mr. Brin, Brun was the um, director of the Glyptothek in Munich, uh, Kreitmeier from the National Museum, and Moset, it was a um, professor at the Polytechnical High School. If you have a look on this tentative list and you were, <coughs> ah, where does it work? Um, and you uh, see the, the left column, um, that's the wish, what they want to have. And if you this is in 1891. And if you have a look on the catalog from this uh, museum from 1908, you find they get it all. They get it all th that they want. And on the right uh, column, you found um, the catalog and who did it. And you compare, can compare also the prices they want to pay and they have to pay. 
okay, let's have a look on this catalog in Munich. Um, if you count the objects, you find the same names, Geiler, you've heard, uh, the conservatorium, this is Brunn maybe, and the technical high school, and people like Zölle. And uh, I will show you the Munich um, Plastercast Formatory. And let's begin with the bigger part, with the formatory for the Munich Academic uh, of Arts. So, you found, <laughs> uh, you found uh, some marks with Geile, Senior and Junior. You find Wolfert as a formatory in this workshop what to do, uh, how to, to bring them in a line. Uh, I look in the Munich address books. This is a good, uh, a good uh, origin to show because you can find where people live and what they are doing. So, um, on, um, you can go from uh, left upside to, to the right side down and you can see who is the formatory at the Munich Academy of Art. And uh, it's possible to follow them all and if you do this, don't forget the woman. Because, <laughs> because if there was written, uh, he is a widow, you know the man is dead. So it's finished. And <laughs> if you want to, to uh, find it all, um, I have had a look uh, on the life of the formatory Georg Geiler. This was a very interesting man. Um, he, he was born in, in a city uh, in the north of Bavaria, where in Kreuzen, where the uh, ceramic mug pots, the beer pot, where you can drink from, <laughs> um, were produced. But uh, the technique um, changed, people drinking out of glasses. So his father goes to Munich, he was a bricklayer, and the, the little one uh, goes to, to a school in Potsdam at 14. At 14 years, he, he was a very clever one. He get a prize. He get a, 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 how to say, a Reiszeug, uh, this, this, a circle and, and, and other things. So, So, um, and, and he learned, to, he learned to, to boss. This is to form uh, like uh, sculptures do with, uh, with clay. And also he made technical uh, right, uh, drawings and so on. So he learned all the things he need later on. And then you find on the right side, his professional activities, and um, it's all the data from the address books in Munich. He, he worked for the, uh, the Academy of Arts. So we have the possibility to, to um, follow people over her life what they are doing. You saw in, in the lecture before, uh, people standing on a, on a, on a leather and uh, make molds and so on. And this formatory do this work. Um, and <coughs> if you have 
su such reference data, you can you can order the uh, the manufacturer marks in a line, in a timeline, the supposed period of date of use. And if you have an object with a mark, you can take it and say, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> you can take it and and it uh, it will be produced between 1870 and 1878. And if you have no um, archive data on something else, it helps very good to uh, to say uh, when were uh, when was it made? Okay, this was was the former Troy Geiler from the uh, um, Academy of Arts. The other we found in Munich is the institution, the Technical High School, and you saw on on the uh, catalog data. Um, the technical high school and the workshop from Zöller are very close connected. And um, on, on the slide you have different colors because the technical high school, they own the molds and the Zöller family do the work. So we have the same the situation, we look in the Munich address book and we can make a timeline. So you can find a timeline uh, for um, more than, let me think about, more than 10, 12 workshops in Europe I found. Okay. We were talking about the owner of the molds. In, in, 19, uh, in 1867, 15 European princes um, designed uh, um, an agreement that they were open their own collections for Casa Plus, for Casa Plus uh, uh, for up forming. And uh, on the left side, uh, you found what uh, the Royal Polytechnical School of Munich can, can do. And we see they can all the things form the Medusa Rondanini. The, you know the, uh, the, the sculptures from the Egena pediment, and so on. I said I go through the world. And here on this uh, slide, all of, of the uh, things I found with a mark from Munich um, in all over the world. And uh, the most interesting things are the, um, the sculptures from the, uh, a fire pediment on, on the right side. Um, if you found here maybe an uh, Athena, Athena Veletri, yes, uh, Athena Veletri, uh, you found the mark from, from Eugen Zeller and also from the uh, institution. This is this is not not so uh, so often. It's very very uh, very sad. You have two marks and one plaster cast. A typology of the manufacturers um, that I found. We, we were talking about uh, the manufacturer marks. These are materially bounded with the plaster cast. And you can see direct uh, the name of the workshop and so on. Uh, there are other 
items, <coughs> they were uh, indirectly connected. The, maybe the dividing of the molds, you saw some things. Um, the parting of the cast, the plinth geometry, and composition of material. So you have indirect uh, things to uh, identify who did it. Um, at the end, I want to show you uh, an example from, from uh, Munich, delivery to Lyon. You found the same name, Brunn, Mozart, the Academy of, of Arts, and they ordered yeah, things like uh, the uh, objects from the, from the pediment of the Afaya Temple, and there is, um, there, when I was there in 2013, they ordered in Munich not all, pe all pieces. They, but I found they have, they have the warrior, um, they call the Telamon. But it were not a Munich mark. It's, they have a, a plaster cast mark from the mu Musee, Musee National Moulage. Why is it so? Ha! Don't read it all. Don't, don't. Uh, you, you go on top, you find the way from the original of these uh, pediment uh, sculptures from Egina to Munich. They go to Rome where Torvaldsen is sub supplementing them. And Ludwig, the king of Bavaria, don't want to have copies. This was 1820 on this time. But he need money. So they made uh, copies for the French Academy in Rome and so on. And so you have the way from from Rome to the French Academy to the uh, Atelier du Moulage in Paris. And uh, the last slide, I can show you. Number East in Warsaw, maybe um, it has no mark, no plaster cast mark. How to say where it comes from? Um, we know we know uh, objects from Paris with a mark in Tartu, maybe, uh, in Tübingen. And we have objects from Munich in Copenhagen or in Tata, it's in, in Hungary. So ask your colleagues, put up the arms and show me how does the the uh, wedge look like. So you can say, oh, it comes from, from Munich, oh, it comes from Paris. Th so you have the connection and what you can do with, with the identification of plaster cars. Um, at the end, I want to open your eyes. Thank you very much. This is a true detective work, extremely useful for provenance and dating studies. Uh, all right, now our last speaker today, uh, Ms. Monika Dunajko, representing the University of Warsaw Museum. 
with the paper Use Your Head, Analysis of Plaster Casts of Ancient Heads from the Warsaw Collection. So thank you very much. Today I would like to tell you about my recent research on Warsaw Collection. And first, uh, I will introduce you to the history of, of the collection, but don't worry, it will be very short. Um, in Poland, collecting ancient works of art and their copies reached the, its apogee during the reign of the last king of Poland, Stanisław August. And in establishing his collection, uh, the king was inspired by the famous private and public collections of uh, antique sculptures that became popular in Italy as early, early as in the 16th century, as well as by the collections of absolute rulers. Despite the financing uh, of a casting workshop in Warsaw and the employment of Italian sculptors, the majority of the plaster copies that make up the collection of Stanisław August were manufactured by foreign studios. The royal collection of, uh, art of ancient artwork was meant to go hand in hand with the founding of the Fine Arts Academy in Warsaw, and inspiration for the planned academy was drawn from the famous schools established again in Italy. Unfortunately, the dream of the king concerning the creation of uh, such a center for the education of artists never came to pass, and the bulk um, of the art-related education was moved to the royal court in Warsaw with the foundation of the painting and sculpting workshops. The plaster copies mentioned above that fulfilled the intentions of the academy's founder became the main educational instrument for young art students. At the end of the reign of Stanisław August, mm, the collection of plaster consisted of 542 pieces and contained, among others, exact full-sized copies of famous statues like Apollo Belvedere, Torso Belvedere, the Laocon Group, Venus de Medici, or Dying Gladiator. In 1817, a year after the mm, creating of the Royal University of Warsaw and following the, the ideas put by the king, the Faculty of Sciences and Arts and Fine Arts was inaugurated. Four years, subsequent curators of the University Gallery of Plaster Casts uh, continued the royal tradition of importing casts made in the best workshops in Europe, so they created a, collect a collection consisted of about 700 uh, copies containing uh, exact full-sized copies, busts, reliefs, uh, anatomical models, and so on. Um, sorry. Uh, they serve generation of students of art, architecture, history, or archaeology. Unfortunately, the subsequent years and the engraving situation in Poland unfavorably impacted the collection later fate. Uh, War-related activities caused a cessation of contacts with foreign ateliers and a reduction of the impressive collection of plaster and the destruction of most of the university archives. The second war resulted in the complete scattering of the gallery. And the university campus was taken by the Nazi soldiers and they destroyed a big part of the collection. At the beginning of 1940, the copies mm, and their fragments were transported uh, to the National Museum in Warsaw, where they stayed until the war was over. In 1946, the collection was distributed to various institutions, and now the major part of the collection you may find the Royal Łazienki Museum, where we are today, and I hope that you will see, see it later. Uh, because all of this, currently it is very difficult to recreate the contacts of curators with the famous studios and to recreate the time of uh, purchases of specific objects. So it's very difficult to conduct a research uh, on the provenance. And therefore, having no access to the most of the archives, I decided to focus on what was left, so on some plaster casts. I asked myself whether the differences in the method of, of, of production, the material that were used, or the technique of making the cast, the technique of making the mold, can bring us closer to knowing the provenance and time of creation of a particular figure. 
I decided to check it out. So I started a very, very preliminary research on the technical aspects. And uh, today I would like you, I would like to present it my first steps. First of all, I wanted to check the material from which the plaster casts were made. I hypothesized that individual ateliers or specific artists used plaster, the composition of which change depending on the additives. The additives may affect the color or the setting time of mass and so on. Knowing the composition and mm, creating a sort of database with information about the material used in particular atelier and in a particular time may facilitate work in the future on determining the provenance and assigning them to a specific studio. The casts of two ancient heads were the first to go, a head of Roma and a head of uh, Paris. Both uh, casts are copies from the Louvre Museum and both casts uh, were made in Paris, in the Louvre, then called Musée Royal, sorry for my French, uh, in the workshop of Francois Jacquet, as evidenced by the stamp placed in the bases. And they were brought to Warsaw in 1820, according to the preserved archives. Uh, their molds were made of quite large pieces, so-called tasseri. The casts are marked with a network of fine lines made by the joints of the pieces of the mold, and the tasseri join at the angle close to 90 degree degrees. Um, what is more, the surface of the plasters is quite porous, uh, and those are mm, the factors that are quite characteristic for figures created in Paris in that time. I additionally, mm, they have the same base type and size. They also do not have any visible internal structures frightening the entire figure. Perhaps it is precisely embedded in the mass, but at this stage of research, it is impossible to confirm it. Uh, I'm not a conservator, so I use the help of more qualified people, Dr. Anna Nowicka from the Faculty of Conservation and Restoration of Works of Art at the Academy of Fine Art in Warsaw, and Andrzej Nowicki, a conservator from the Royal Łazienki Museum. For the purposes of my study, we took two samples from each head. We made sure that they were collected from a not very visible places and did not contain any modern layers after conservation carried out several years ago. The samples mm, were analyzed for the elemental composition using a Zeiss Sigma VAU-P scanning microscope with an EDS microprobe and for the phase composition analysis using the X-ray diffraction method. And actually the results are very fresh because I get them a few days ago, literally a few days ago. Uh, as for the analysis of the elemental composition, in both cases it showed mainly the presence of calcium and sulfate, a very small addition of carbon, oxygen, sodium, uh, and silicon was found as well. Examination of Roma's head also showed trace amounts of magnesium, which is typical natural additives of gypsum and calcium carbonate. Um, and when it comes to the analysis of the phase composition, they showed that the main component of Roma's head is gypsum, it's 95%, and calcite, which is a variety of calcium carbonate, and it's 5%. And Paris's head, also gypsum, 92%, and calcite, 8%. In addition, the samples contain trace amounts of quartz, sodium, and magnesium, but it was less than 1%. This analysis indicates that Jacquet used a plaster without any mineral modifying additives to make both casts. A very slight difference in the composition of the material allows us to assume that they were probably made of the same mixture. Uh, this was the very first stage of research and they will be continued and supported by other methods, including checking which organic additives can be detected in the analyzed material. Uh, it's also planned to conduct similar tests on a larger sample of casting to compare the composition of the material used in different periods. Uh, I hope that this will bring us closer to better understanding of the history of figures about which we know much less. In the meantime, waiting for the results of the chemical analysis, I decided to perform a completely different type of test. 
and I used two other heads, head of Zeno and head of Mercury, from the collection of the University of Warsaw Museum. Unlike the previous mentioned cluster card, in this case, unfortunately, we don't know the author, we don't know the prototypes, and we don't know the exact year of their creation. We only know that they were brought to Warsaw by the already mentioned King Stanislav August before 1795. They probably come from two different workshops, which is indicated by differences in the form and size of the bases and in the way they are reinforced from the inside. Mercury is reinforced with canvas embodied in plaster, while Xenon has a kind of wooden spine inside. The examination which I will tell you about in a moment was made in the Radiologica Magnetic Resonance Laboratory in Warsaw, which agreed to conduct all of analysis free of charge, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I wanted to check what exactly the inside of Zeno and Mercury look like. I could do it with the use of magnetic resonance imaging, which I didn't because I was aware that inside these heads there are some modern metal elements. And I could um, do it also with um, a computer tomography, which I finally decided to do. In both cases, we checked what a plaster cast looks like when it, it's examined as soft tissue and as bone tissue. This allowed us to detect differences in the density of the material by gray values from black for zero and it's a void to white for high density. Cast plaster derives with uh, different densities depending on the surrounding media. For example, liquid plaster filled into a lubricated mold has high density, while the second and the third layers derive to a lower density. Later addition of plaster due to sculptural reworking and restorations have visible differences in densities as well. And for example, with this analysis, we were able to note that the boost of Zeno was serious in the past and later it was reconstructed. We didn't know uh, about this before, so it was quite exciting to find it, this, this out. Uh, what is more city allows us to see all the voids and cracks, uh, and that could be very useful in the case of conservation work. During the analysis, we could also pay attention to the internal reinforcements like canvas and wood, which I mentioned earlier, and compare their densities. Um, these results allowed me to support my thesis that these heads were most likely created in two different studios or are, are the work of two different artists because they show differences in the technique of their production. Similar to chemical research, this type of analysis will be also continued on other castings. Taking advantage of the fact that the heads were in my hands, uh, I made 3D models of Zeno and Mercury, uh, which will help me in further stylistic analysis. I also hope that their publication will make it possible to find the prototypes of these uh, heads. Perhaps someone who will see them, maybe you, uh, will help me solve the mystery of who Zenon and Mercury really are. To sum up, the analyses I have just presented as, uh, are at a very, very early stage and certainly need to be explored more and need to be supported by conservators. Nevertheless, they are the first step to learning about the historical techniques of making plaster casts of ancient sculptures from the Warsaw Collection. Um, and I hope that their continuation will allow me to develop a method for examining the provenance of figures and determining the time of their creation when access to archives is very limited. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now something that everyone was surely waiting for, the time for questions. We had four very interesting papers. So I would like to invite questions without any particular order of speakers. Um, yes. Um, I want to put the microphone a little bit on it. Or that one here. I, I have 
have a uh, question uh, to Dr. Magdalena Getadi, if I may. Um, yes, I, uh, I would like to ask you about the 3D uh, casts you mentioned. So, um, which is, what is the production process for these? Uh, uh, do I understand right that these are 3D printed or uh, they are made based on 3D, 3D scans? Mm -hmm. And um, what is your opinion on their quality compared to the costs made with previous techniques? I don't know if I, it works. Okay. Thank you for your question. Actually, uh, this is the only printed version of a plastic cast that we uh, had for exhibition of um, ancient uh, Salona that uh, I uh, worked with uh, Dr. Uh, Jelicic Radonic. And actually, uh, I don't think it's a the quality of the 3D printed uh, version is not as good as plaster cast. This uh, specific uh, plaster cast that I showed, uh, we got from uh, and uh, we are very thankful for uh, Graz Archaeological Institute. They made it for us uh, free of charge for this uh, exhibition. And our workshop doesn't do this 3D. We only have some uh, collaboration with the Faculty of Philosophy. Some students are making for us 3D uh, presentations for our digital collection, uh, which are, we are not printing them. But this printed version is very unique to us uh, because uh, this... Um, uh, satiri uh, are from uh, Salona and this is the uh, most beautiful representation of uh, Hellenistic sculpture in Croatia which is today uh, which was sold in 19th century and today is in Chicago Art Institute so having the printed version it's very uh, specific and unique for us <laughs> for our collection. I can understand that. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, may I ask just one uh, small thing from uh, Dr. Shum, if I may, or maybe that, that just a comment uh, because I come from Budapest and I worked on uh, the rehabilitation project of the Budapest casts. Yeah. So there are two uh, museums that have uh, opened since then. One is in Budapest, uh, that's a usable storage rather, and in Komárom, uh, if you go to Hungary, you I will know, find I you noticed. have been already. I was, I was being in Tatar also. Yes, that's the previous uh, museum, but yes. now in Komárom, there's a new exhibition, this and new there one. are uh, approximately 200 casts uh, yeah. exhibiting them. I know it. Same okay, time. okay, I just there checked. You <laughs> yep. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Um, my question is for both Astrid and Magdalena. Um, in, in terms of the casts from the antique in your respective collections, I was wondering if there were any particular cast makers that are like heavily featured that the collections have a lot of works by, um, or if they're identified by which cast maker made them at all. At which time? Uh, like the early ones, like the Mings. Yes, um, yes there are famous workshops in Rome and um, they are not all known, but uh, some of them were known. And um, Mengs commissioned the cast in these workshops. <coughs> Cacciatori, for example, and there are some others. And it's documented. For our collection, actually, uh, we do have, I was uh, present on the first version of this conference, so I didn't mention it today, but our antique plaster casts that were collected uh, from uh, 1892 to 1995, actually they're all from very uh, renovated uh, plaster cast uh, from Dix Formerai in Berlin, uh, Georg Geiler that was mentioned, um, from all uh, kinds of uh, renowned plaster casters. And these national casts are uh, made in our workshop uh, in uh, Zagreb, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe I can add, it's the same as the Dresden collection because the later casts are also made in all these famous or well-known workshops in Berlin and Munich and Paris, everywhere. Thank you. Another question now. 
Um, I had a question sort of for all the panelists, so it might be hard to, to know who should stand up at the front, but um, I hope this doesn't seem like an ignorant question because I'm not a specialist in plaster cast, but it seems to me like I'm starting to see a lot of, of work on plaster casts in like the last 10 years or so, that it sort of seems like a boom area for research, like the history of plaster cast collections in museums. And I'm wondering if that's the, also the perception the experts have, and if so, if you think that why that would be, and, and whether it's linked to sort of contemporary uh, technologies of reproduction, things like 3D printing, or questions about authenticity and reproduction. Um, so I'll give that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a complicated question. I will try to answer it because Art in 20th century, art uh, uh, academies, they uh, started not to uh, work on plaster casts, antique plaster casts, they started to draw and work uh, uh, art, uh, drawings or uh, sculptures to, na to na uh, natal, uh, to the, how to say, I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> um, not through casts, but uh, for real persons. And this um, actually, uh, how to say it, um, in the 20th century uh, was rejecting plaster casts. So many, uh, these were many topics of this uh, uh, 10 years back or 20 years back, many conferences and many studies that plaster cast collections have been uh, thrown, they were uh, scattered, they were, and in later years, and later 20 years, uh, that we are trying to put them out of the storages, trying to show what they were worth of, because uh, ancient uh, sculptures could only be seen in some museums. For example, as uh, Dr. Schwann told us, in Australia, in, uh, in, in uh, America, you could see ancient sculpture only through plaster casts. And I think that this is the main reason. And of course, today 3D technology is one of the reasons which is very accessible to everybody. You can take your mobile phone and uh, scan the <laughs> sculpture. I don't know if this answers part of your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if no one else wants to say anything, that's fine. It's only a short addition, it's, it's absolutely right, but um, regarding the historical casts from the 18th century, this is a very, very um, great treasure to, to preserve it. And that was also a starting point for the research on it and going on to the later periods. But there's still the question how to present plaster casts today if it's not only the historical part and um, is it, can it be contemporary? Uh, if you come to the uh, orangery later on, you can see old plaster casts from Berlin maybe, the Harmodios and Aristogeiton. And if you see the originals in Naples today, they don't look like this. So you can see different, uh, different uh, types of reproduction and what happened in Rome uh, to, to produce plaster cars and, and uh, sell it in the world. Yes. I, I don't have a question, but I have also a comment about this plaster cast because I'm also a plaster cast uh, collection curator in Tartu. Uh, that uh, today, for example, we are uh, using uh, all these kind of um, nowadays methods to analyze our plaster cast uh, to get more knowledge about conservation and restoration history because that's um, about uh, two uh, centuries. We have the history of the conservation of plaster cast. So this is also an interesting point why plaster casts are very important. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. Yes, I have a question for Dr. Schwann. Uh, did the formatory from the Mumis 
the deformatory from Munich work during the war because I read, maybe it was even in your article that Gibbs Formerai in Berlin worked during the Second War and I wonder if it was the same in Munich. Um, sorry, one, once again, okay. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not clear. Did the formatory from Munich yeah. work during the Second War? Because I know that Gibbs Formerai in Berlin worked during the Second War, and I wonder if it was the same in, in Munich or not. Oh, if you have workshops all, all over. And uh, these formatory are working near with the Glyptothek in Munich, Munich uh, Ludwig's collection, yeah, you know, and uh, the Academy of Arts. They produce plaster casts for the education of the sculptures of the painters and so on. So, uh, and the technical high school, there are, there was a, a free hand drawing classes and they, they made, uh, they made uh, pictures like this. They have to draw and to learn what to do. And that's the reason why our architecture looked like in Antiki, yeah? <laughs> so they, they have this, uh, this sculptures as, as an example for the, for the work. Anything? Yes. Thank you. I got a question for Monica. Uh, and uh, first I would like to thank all of the speakers for really, really interesting and great presentations today. Uh, and uh, then I would like to say that it sounds like a really, really interesting and fascinating subject and I, I am absolutely sure it will be a, a gr great dissertation. Uh, it feels like this is a part of a growing field, uh, what's been called technical art history, uh, with this kind of investigations combined with a more traditional way of uh, investigation, investigating art history. Uh, and my question is regarding uh, the more traditional way by looking at the sources and archives uh, on the limitations. Why are, uh, or why they are limitations? Is it because of uh, the archives are lost or they are not accessible because of restrictions? Or the almost all of, the, all of the archives of the University of Warsaw were mm, destroyed during the war, so we get only a, a little part o of the archive, so it's the main problem. And sometimes we have to go to, mm, to abroad, to, to archives, to, to find letters from the Polish students, from Polish uh, professors uh, in doing the business. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we have to finish this uh, really, really interesting discussion, uh, which you can, of course, continue later. But uh, before we finish, I would like to take advantage of uh, having the microphone and ask a question myself. And the question will be for Dr. Magdalena de Taldic, uh, because um, mm, you mentioned that in your collection in the museum there are also casts, uh, molds, sorry, which are historical and you mentioned that uh, some of them you've been using for more than 70 years, right? But at the same time, they are molds, I imagine that among them there may be molds that were taken from artworks that don't exist anymore or were damaged. Um, so I wanted to ask what's the status of these molds, whether they are, because they're still functional, right? They're still mm -hmm. used for making casts, but at the same time, they're an important record of the lost or deteriorated artworks, so do they have a collection status or what's their... Yeah, yeah, they are part of our collection. We have uh, the molds not only from antique collection and antique collection from Croatian uh, city, but also this national heritage, which is very unique. I told you the example of the uh, our war in the 90s uh, that uh, some parts of the architecture were destroyed. So those molds or, or those casts 
serves as uh, the only uh, visible or 3D presentation to reconstruct. So it's important in restoration and conservation uh, work. Yeah, so even though the molds are still being used for making casts, they are themselves uh, kind of uh, under some kind of um, conservation protection or something, right? Because the they're... Yeah, they are a part of our collection, which okay. is registered uh, on okay. the city level. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm asking because mm -hmm. uh, I know that recently uh, the Gibbs formula in Berlin is mm -hmm. being prepared for being turned into a collection, which mm -hmm. was not before, so they had kind of the same uh, issue of uh, uh, mm, transforming items, the molds that were strictly functional into being also museum collection items. So that's the yeah, that's the problem, but uh, their significance is really uh, of the national level. Right. So they are, I, my opinion is that they have the same status as exactly. the, not the, the molds and the casts the same. Yeah. Maybe the molds even better even because some of right. the parts are lost or destroyed. Exactly. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, and would you like to say something on the part of the organizers? <laughs> Thank you to all the speakers and to Michal and Julia for chairing the sessions today and for the audience for bearing with us for so long. And um, now at four, we have two uh, options for you. One is a tour, a guided tour around the museum and the other is a plaster casting workshop in the old orangery. So the group who wants to do the tour We'll meet outside with our tour guide. And the group who wants to go to the workshop will follow me back to the orangery. And we were also thinking that we can use this uh, time we have, 10 minutes, to take a group photo of us all outside the palace. So let's move outside and try to form a group. 